I have a pre-show. All right. And then uh, if we don't have a better post show, I did have a Synology adventure a week or two back that you will, the both of you will find quite humorous because I almost died again. But, uh, but we don't have to do that if we end up on something better. I think we might lead there a little bit earlier. Oh, no. That scares me. I don't know. I don't like where this is going at all. How long is your pre-show going to be? If your pre-show is going to be an hour long, maybe think of it as a topic. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, God. I'm very scared. You're going right. to be like, what is the that movie? I mean, I think The Fugitive does it a few other ones. Uh, Todd uh, tweets about it sometimes where, like, the title card for the movie comes up, like, 40 minutes in. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Or, like, uh, the other one is, like, when does the last credit appear on the screen? Some of those are, like, you know, 40, 50 <laughs> minutes into the movie. The last, like, it says, you know, directed by whatever, like, 50 minutes of the movie is ridiculous. So It's going to be one of those days. <laughs> oh, wait, I need to open IRC. Shoot. Yeah, I didn't have it open either. I kind of dislike textual because textual is taking over like the T-E-X like shortcut. You know what I mean? Because mm. I want to launch text edit. Okay. Wait, you launched text edit? Yeah. That For what? Sometimes I need <laughs> styled text. <sighs> for what? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you need fonts, you know? Yeah, but if you're, I mean, anything I would use rich text for, I would do in pages because it's probably something I'm making, I'm printing out. Pages, come on. Ugh. Why else would I use rich text? <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of agree with Marco on this one, to be honest with you. Like, all, all plain text documents open up in TextMate. And for you, I'm sure it's BB Edit. And for Casey, mm-hmm. I'm sure it's some kind of garbage thing made by Microsoft. Oh, stop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not some non-native app. I've never actually used it. I don't, I don't even know how good it is. But I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> but, but no, text edit launches real fast. And if you just want to do some style text, like, you know, or let's say, say you want to print like a label or something. I just want to launch an app that launches real quick and print some style text. No way I would launch pages. Are you kidding? I guess I, yeah, I would just use pages for that. Oh, text edit launches instantly. Maybe you're so accustomed to using a 12 year old computer that, like, now that you have a fast one, you, you <laughs> don't realize, like, oh, pages also launches instantly. Yeah, right. Let's see. Let's see how long oh, yeah. pages takes. Three, four, five, six, six bounces, six all bounces. Right, all all right. right. Now the text <laughs> came up. All right. Now let's see text edit. Text edit. One, done. <laughs> Yeah, it's six times faster, as counted in bounces. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Before the show, uh, John has instituted over the last, I don't know, six months, maybe a year, uh, something that he likes to call pre-flight, where we kind of run through what we're going to talk about. And it's actually very helpful as much as I give him grief for it. And Marco just kind of slid in in the midst of pre-flight. I have a pre-show, which is fine. That's not entirely unusual. And then as we keep talking, I said, oh, you know, I have an after show about how I had a heart attack about my Synology. And and Marco said, well, that might come up before the after show. I'm getting really nervous and I would like to end my misery as quickly as possible. So what's going on, Marco? Well, let me start by saying that my Mac Mini flooded my closet. What? (laughs) What are you talking about? I'm trying to think what kind of things involving water does the Mac Mini control? The ice machine? No. So here's here's what happened, listeners. When I moved away from the Mac Mini as my desktop, when when the Pro laptops came out, I switched, as you know, to my desktop laptop, which I'm I'm still extremely happy with. And in fact, um, the Mac Mini and uh, Tiff's old Intel MacBook Pro are both, as we speak, sitting in their trade-in boxes waiting to be shipped out. The Mac Mini is no longer going to be used as a, as a home server because what I was using it for. So here, you know, backing up a little bit, when the, when I got the new laptop, I figured I, I have some uses for a home server here and there, pretty light uses, if I'm honest, but I could use one here and there, you know. Network storage is probably the biggest uh, use case. Um, and then I was thinking, like, in the past, I've used my Mac Mini um, back in the other house. I used, I used an old Intel Mac Mini to, like, run the crappy so- software for my scanner and stuff like that that I didn't want cluttering up my, my main Mac. Or... Um, you know, when I had the Synology back at home, uh, I would run the iSCSI Terminator on that Mac Mini because iSCSI is such a garbage fire on Mac OS. Um, but I was using iSCSI so the backblaze could back it up. That, remember that whole thing? So anyway, mm-hmm. so I thought, I have some uses for a home server. That was, that was the idea. And I had two 8-terabyte external SSDs that were serving as 
massive storage for both me and Tiff. They were serving as Time Machine uh, hosting as well as archive storage. And because they were mounted on a Mac, the archive storage was also being backed up to Backblaze. So I figured that was a really good solution overall. And I, I, I originally got the SSDs so that it could live in my office because th- they don't make any noise and I don't allow fans in my office. Um, so it was fine in my office, but my, my office here is kind of small and I, I wanted to get it out of my office because once it's operating as a server, a Mac mini doesn't really need to be next to you. It can be anywhere in your network and it serves the same purpose. Um, So I happen to have a closet nearby that hosts the router and the switch. I figured I can put the Mac mini in this closet. It's perfect. Actually, there's, there's plenty of room for it on this, on this high up shelf. All all the networking gear is right there. So I brought the Mac mini in there, uh, you know, about a month ago. And I also brought with it the two, eight terabyte external SSDs. Um, and they, the, each one of those is just in like a $15 cable matters enclosure from Amazon where like, you know, one side is metal and the bottom plate is plastic and just like, you know, a basic U- USB-C uh, external enclosure. I did run into a couple of issues there. The M1 Mac Mini is actually kind of a crappy server. It seems to require a keyboard to be connected to it to boot. You know, I, I tried from previous Mac Minis, I knew that if you were going to run a Mac Mini headless, that you would want one of those little HDMI dummy port dongle things. That way it thinks there's a hardware monitor plugged in. Mm-hmm. That was the first thing I got. Um, but the M1 series of Mac Minis is more complicated than that to run headless. You actually need a keyboard connected, otherwise it will not boot headless. So, And I had mixed luck getting it to boot or not boot with a password it, it, it ended up being complicated so that was kind of crappy and and i didn't i didn't love that other than that it seemed to work okay um but i did notice that every so often i would open up that closet and it would be really warm in there okay so I'm, like, I, I'm thinking like is it is all i've changed recently is i put this mac mini there well i reached up and i felt and i noticed that those ssds run pretty hot actually like for some reason an, an SSD that is idle most of the time, for whatever reason, these things run really hot. I imagine not all SSDs are like this, but these these you know big eight terabyte cheapo Micron ones uh, were definitely like this. That's why Sony requires a heatsink on SSDs. That you, if you buy like a third party M.2 SSD for your PlayStation Five, you must use a heatsink with it. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I I never really thought about whether SSDs run hot because I I always assumed they wouldn't. Uh, but no, the I mean, I'm sure it depends a lot on you know what what they are and how they're controlled and everything. But these definitely run pretty hot. I also noticed that the surface of the Mac Mini itself was like you know once it's in a warm closet, it actually was kind of warm as well. I, I kind of made a mental note like I should probably move these somewhere else sometime. Well, the other day I was um, working in that closet a little bit. I, I, I we have a printer in there too, so I was you know, trying to feed some stuff into the printer, and I noticed that the shelf was wet. What? Because one other thing I keep in that closet, it well kept in that closet. Oh no! <laughs> blocks of ice <laughs> is a gallon of distilled water f- for putting into my rowing machine. <laughs> oh, is this distilled water? So then that shouldn't conduct electricity as easily, right? Uh, theoretically, I hope. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I noticed that the gallon of distilled water that was back there um, was about half filled and kind of imploded slightly like as if there had been some thermal contraction <laughs> oh no is, is the uh, the gallon of whatever water that's on the floor right no it's up on the shelf along with the, everything else oh imagine that you put, you put a thing of water high up imagine on the shelf. that imagine it could just happen to you it could just happen to you john it, it like happens. it's heavy like don't you want it on the ground you don't want to reach up to a high shelf and pull down a big thing of water it's a big shell i mean it, it, it the weight wasn't a problem it what, what gallon of water weighs what like seven pounds it's not <laughs> like can we can we just learn Putting water up high is called a water tower, and it's to get water pressure to places, to places in the Midwest, right? <laughs> Don't do that in your house unless you're trying to create a miniature water tower for a tiny Lego village that you have on the floor. <laughs> well, anyway, um, 
most of the water, well, about half of that gallon of water had leaked out over some time period. I It sure looks like it was due to um, some thermal issues that were happening <laughs> nearby. Uh, so it got so hot that it melted or weakened the wall of a plastic container containing water? It seemed to have weakened the wall of it enough to make a tiny little hole somewhere on like one of the seams. Mm. What, kind of, what kind of container does this come in? Can you describe, like, what is it? Like like a gallon of milk, kind of, you know, like the, that big plastic. Exa- exactly like a gallon of milk? Yeah, that, like that big, the big plastic thing with the handle. Oh, okay. Right, yeah, no, do not put <laughs> jugs full of milk <laughs> high up on shelves near electronics. What are you doing? It was distilled water. It's not conducting. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, this, I'd never seen this happen before. It's right next to the mineral oil. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, fortunately, nothing was damaged, and the water didn't escape the shelf and stain the floor or anything. So that's that's good. And didn't even seem to stain the shelf somehow. Um it's a, I guess it's a good shelf. So anyway, <laughs> besides a couple of you know a couple of sheets of printer paper that got wet and got ruined, uh, and a few cardboard boxes for things I didn't need anymore, including this Mac Mini, um, nothing else seemed to have been damaged by this. So fortunately, that that's good. Wait, are you going to trade in this Mac Mini now that's been in in the water? The Mac Mini was not in the water. It was on. It was one shelf above. All right. <laughs> Same closet, one shelf mm-hmm. above. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so I, I realized I need to. I need to. You know get rid of the situation now i mean also i need to stop collecting water in my closet but you know that that's that problem just solved itself there is there is now no more water left in my closet <laughs> um, so <laughs> my closet has good drainage did it just leak out of your house but <laughs> <laughs> no, it just it sat on the shelf. Like it, it wasn't it didn't have enough surface uh tension or it there wasn't enough volume of water to overcome the surface tension to make it go over the edge. Hmm. So it was just like a like a shallow layer of water on the shelf, but I I got it. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> that's not the point of the story. Do you have photo we need even if you don't post them, just we need some private photos of Yes, concur. I didn't take any I, I was busy freaking out and getting paper towels. I know. <laughs> I'm just going to say to the listeners, in general, I know you hear the idea of like a server closet or whatever, but closets are terrible places for, for anything that produces heat. Unless yes. you have a ventilated closet, <laughs> a closet that has airflow going into and out of it, don't put things in closets or media cabinets for that matter if they're entirely enclosed. You need some source of fresh, cool air for your electronics to be healthy. Turns out. <laughs> so, anyway... <laughs> And yeah, this is not a ventilated closet. Although the networking gear does fine in there. You know, it's the, the Ubiquiti Dream Machine, a big switch. Like, you know, it's fine. I'm sure it does fine because it's more tolerant, but it's not great for that either. Well, fair, but I, I've never, I've literally, like, with the exception of since I moved the Mac Mini in there, I've never opened up that closet and felt it noticeably warm. And it's an interior closet to the house, so it doesn't get too hot in the summer or too cold in the winter either. So anyway, I realize I, I have to, I have to adjust my Mac Mini setup. So. I have a couple other places around the house I could put it that are that are like somewhat enclosed but better better thermally controlled. Like there's a utility closet on the outside that has electrical stuff in it, and that's that's fairly controlled. So I'm like, all right, I could put it in there. But I realized I was doing all this. You know, this Mac Mini. I, I looked up the trade in price, and the trade in price was like eight hundred dollars with Apple or with someone else. With Apple, okay. So I was like, all right, I could I could trade this in. What do I actually need this for? Could I get away with less? Is there something else that I could spend the eight hundred dollars on that that might solve my needs in a better way? Um, and or you know something like this is not a great solution that I have here. It seems like both a waste of a perfectly good M one workstation computer that could be used in other ways, and also you know this is not a great uh, storage solution physically or logically. Like as I mentioned, it's kind of a crappy home server. So I thought, all right, let me let me think about some other options here. As much as I hated to admit this, I thought maybe some kind of network attached storage would would probably solve this need better. If the, the main thing I needed it for is time machine. Tiff and I now both have large laptop internal storage, and we can fit almost all of our archive files on our laptops. All we really need something else for is time machine. The time machine does, to ha- does have to be fairly large, though. Tiff's laptop is 8 terabytes minus 4. I need a lot of terabytes of time machine and not much else. So I basically just need, like, um, what were those? Ti- time capsule. I need a time capsule, but, like, for the modern age. So I decided this would be best solved by a network attached storage device. Indeed. Putting storage on the network would indeed be best solved by a network-attached storage device. I agree. Preferably that you do not store in a closet. (laughs) 
So what did you buy? <sighs> Take a guess. Did you buy a Synology? I got I got a Synology. I got another one. Attaboy, which one did you get? Uh, so here, I'm not even sure I should tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I honestly I'm not up to date on the newest Synology stuff. In fact, I was just uh, discussing this with a friend via text the other day. My Synology that my primary Synology that I use probably more heavily than either of you guys is still the original one that Synology sent us in like 2013. It's almost 10 years old. Now, granted it's the ship of Theseus. The 1813 plus, right? Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, 1813 plus. I, I upgraded the RAM on mine. Did I tell you that? No, you didn't. Was that easy? Because when Synology's like uh, OS 7 came out, they said, oh, uh, you know, you can get by with this much RAM or we recommend that much. And I'm like, huh, I wonder how hard it is to upgrade the RAM on Synology. Turns out it's not hard at all. It's super cheap. I bought a little RAM expansion thing, opened it up, shoved it on. While I was in there, I sprayed out some of the dust, slapped it back together, it's got like double the RAM that it had before. Huh. Yeah, still going strong. Right, can we put that in the parking lot and talk about <laughs> it later, please? Because I, I genuinely would like to know about that, but we can take that offline. So yeah, so uh, anyway, the, to very briefly, so I have this 1813 Plus that's sitting here now, despite my tale of woe that I'll hopefully get to later, um, is, is running really well, but I know the clock is ticking. And I, as you, as listeners have really found out in the last couple of weeks, I am a little bit on the frugal side and I really don't want to buy another eight base Synology. And then the proper answer is probably to fill it with all new hard drives rather than to just extract the ones in the current Synology and punt them over to the new one. So that's like a several thousand dollar expenditure that I really don't feel like doing wait, right now. Wait, wait, how much space are you using? I think I'm using around 11 terabytes at the moment. Okay. I can tell you exactly how much it would cost to replace that because I just did that. Good. Okay. Well, tell me more. <laughs> okay. But did Marco get the one that's all SSDs? Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> well, I thought about it. So first I thought, all right, if I get, they they made a, a few a few years ago, I don't think any of them are still made, but they made some that only took two and a half inch discs. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, no, you don't want that. That's gross. There was a little tiny six bay. Oh, I bet that was adorable. It was. It, yeah, it's, it's, there's a six bay. It's called the DS620 Slim. It, it doesn't seem like it's currently made, but you can still find a couple of them for sale here and there. Um, but it's like a little tiny six bay <laughs> SSD only one, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, but I realized like, okay, for my actual needs here, A, I don't have six ssd size discs i don't really need to or want to have those and also i want this to be very large storage and it, it can be very large very cheap you know th and so i'm looking at three and a half inch drives but i also realized like i also don't want like my needs here while they are large they are also simple i'm not running plex on this thing i'm not gonna get into like the Docker fest and running apps and having it download pirated movies for me and everything. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. It just needs to host Time Machine. A Raspberry Pi could possibly have done this, you know, it, with more work. <laughs> so it's it's really, it's fine. Anyway, so I decided I'm just going to get a small one. Now, I know Merlin would kill me if I got a two bay. And, and, and that is correct, by the way. But I really only want two discs. If all I'm doing is time machine, theoretically, I can get a one bay one <laughs> because uh, I can just get well, a single yeah. like 16 terabyte hard drive and be fine. Like that's all I would really need. And in your defense, when we had first gotten these, uh, these analogies, you know, almost a decade ago, you and I were talking, maybe it was all three of us, but I remember particularly you and I, Marco, were talking about how to uh, allocate these eight drives and what you had said you were going to do. And I agreed with it and still am doing to this day is you said you were going to, what is it? Raid zero, two of the physical drives, which is to say, uh, uh, make it as though it's virtually one large drive, but the only thing that gets uh, put on that drive is Time Machine. Right. Because that's redundant, and yes, I'm sure John is fuming right now, but I concur with you, Marco, that for something that is already redundant, it is not the end of the earth if it poops the bed. So, right, like, if you have Time Machine and Backblaze, you're pretty well covered, and you can put that Time Machine on a single disc or a RAID 0 or whatever, it's fine. If you like to live dangerously, I'll I'll cross that bridge when I eventually run out of storage because you know that's like the last bridge. Like, how do I get more storage back? Well, I'll break that RAID array, you know, yeah. that break that RAID five array, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then put it into RAID zero, and voila, you've like doubled your. And that's where I'm gonna run out of storage. Like, you know, because we I we back up everything to Time Machine to that all the laptops in the house, all the desktops, everything, and that adds up after a while. Yeah. So anyway, I uh, I realized my actual storage needs are you know they're large in the sense of you know we have roughly 12 terabytes maybe 13 of time machine data that, that i want to back up that's a lot but also 
modern hard drives go up to 18 terabytes. So in a sense, it, it is a lot like in absolute terms, uh, but relative to modern hard drives, if you're buying new equipment, it kind of isn't a lot. That's why I said like I could get away with a one or two bay one because really I just need like one drive worth of storage. Um, so I looked at my options. I ended up going with one called the DS420J. It's four bays, and it has otherwise pretty minimal features. Nothing is hot swappable on it. It doesn't have, I don't think it has any of the like fancy media encoding features or anything like that. But what's nice about the 420J is that it is compact and quiet and low powered. And so if you're going to put it in a closet or something, those are pretty attractive uh, qualities. And it's not that expensive. It's $300 empty. That's really not bad. Yeah, for a four-bay Synology, that's pretty good. And by the way, looking at the the official site for this device, uh, DS420J is a four-bay desktop NAS designed for home data backup, blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> I think you're, you're barking up the correct tree, I would say. But is it rated for outdoor use? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. As long as there's a roof over it, it'll be fine, right? Yeah, theoretically. Yeah, totally, it doesn't, totally. It, the rain doesn't get to that area. <laughs> <laughs> So I got it, I set it up today, and I put into it only two drives so far. I figure I, if I really need expansion later, I can expand later. I probably never will. Um, but it's good to have the four bays for flexibility in the future if need be, given that the price was so good on this. And the drives I got were two Seagate, whatever, whatever, 18 terabyte drives that for some reason are on sale right now for like $350 each. Where? Uh, how do you get the drives in this thing? The, you actually like unscrew the butt it's like it's like those like those old overalls where you'd like unbutton things for like the butt access panel yeah i saw the, but the, the back panel i see two big openings for fans so you open you open that up you see those those giant black thumb screws on the corners of those fan the fan panel you unscrew all those and the whole back hinges down and then does it flap down like a door yeah i see it does the do the fans come with it when it hinges down yes and then it's just four vertically and then, yeah, it's, it, yeah, you have these, these four trays you pull out and stick the hard drives in. Um, yeah, so it's it's fine. I, I did the, the new setup. Um, like I mean, the last time I set up a Synology was like 2013. It's they, They've come a long way since then. I did it all from an iPhone app to start, like the whole, you know, finding your IP and setting up your admin password and stuff. And I, I, I did like the the rest of the setup via the web interface, like when I had to enable time machine share, shares. It's been totally fine to set up. It, it, was, a, it was a very quick and easy process. Um, it was it was really nice. So overall, I'm I'm satisfied so far. We'll see how it goes, but I think this will be a really good solution. And what I and, and I, I've decided here, you know, in the past, I have had issues as talked on the show about like wh- how the heck do you back up a Synology? Yeah, tell me about it. You can't use Backblaze or, or the, you know most of the any good cloud backup. You for can it. use B B two. Well, right, but you can't you can't have like unlimited capacity. <laughs> you you got to pay per gig, and you can use various services to pay per gig. Backblaze B two is one of those services, or you could do you know S three or whatever else. So those options exist. I don't love those options. What I decided to do with this is because we now both have these large laptops, and because the Synology we mostly just need it for Time Machine, I've decided to only use it for Time Machine effectively maybe i'll like you know if if i have some kind of weird like app i want to run on maybe i'll do that in the future i again i don't think it's very likely but what i really want here is for the computers themselves that we're using to be the primary storage and to have the network attached thing only be for backup and that way i never have to worry about how the heck i back up the synology i recommend eventually like it's it's hard for me to believe that you're going to have this four base analogy that you only have two bays filled on that you're only ever going to use it for time machine eventually inevitably you're going to fill those other two bays and then you're going to have more storage than you need and then you're going to put files on it and then you're going to think about backing it up and when you do that several years from now i'm here to tell you like using the 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 native or whatever the synology b2 backup thing and just pointing it not at your time machine volume but at your other volume it's really simple. It's pretty darn cheap. It's not as cheap as like the $5 flat rate per month, whatever Backblaze is now. You pay per, you know, byte that you store. But to give an example, you know what I back up from my from my Synology there? Yes, there's a, a smattering of files that are only on the Synology for storage or whatever. And of course, they get backed up through the B2. I back up my media library, which I don't need any of that. I can reconstitute that at any time from other sources, but I don't want to. So I pay 
to back it up to B2. You're talking about things like like rip Blu-rays and stuff? Yeah. That's got to be a fortune. It's not. It's like it's like $8 a month. No, B2 is really cheap. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's not that much money. Uh, I looked at this, and for 10 terabytes, it was not cheap at all. Well, anyway, I also I also have two Synologies, and I back up one Synology to the other Synology. A subset of it, right? So I've got the big Synology, and then a subset of the big Synology syncs, through, again, through built-in software that comes with the Synology. I can sync a subset of it to the other Synology. It's very convenient. Yeah, it's five terabyte, five dollars per terabyte per month. So that's you know fifty bucks a month for me. Yeah, I don't have like a giant media library. Like, it's yeah, not... see, that's the problem with having a giant media library. <laughs> see, and see, I've decided for that. Like, I, I mean, look, I've I ripped a lot of Blu-rays and DVDs in, in my time, but I decided like, you know, I have all those sitting on my my other Synology. I have all those sitting there, and I never watch them. Most of the movies that I that I've bought on physical media, either I never watch. Or when I want to watch them, I can watch them on whatever used to, whatever iTunes is called now because I hooked up that Movies Anywhere thing years back, mm-hmm. and so and all those purchases I like redeemed all the all the Blu-ray codes for all the discs I had, and so almost every movie I own on physical media in any modern format like Blu-ray, I have access to that for free or for no additional cost through iTunes. So I can I can always just go and watch those whenever I want, and. Yeah, the quality is not going to be as good streaming, you know, playing off of the Apple Store compared to a much higher bitrate Blu-ray. But I also just don't care anymore. And I've decided, like, the simplicity of that setup is so much nicer than having to maintain my own, like, physical copy or, or, you know, whatever, physical or digital copy of this thing, like, sitting on a disc I own somewhere and having to worry about things like file management and backups and data integrity like all that stuff i've just decided like i uh, there's so much in my life that i care so deeply about and that i nerd out about i had to get rid of some stuff and that's one of the things i got rid of you know and that makes sense especially if you're only consuming media that's easily findable replaceable buyable whatever fair point as we've talked about a lot and i don't need to belabor the point that i tend to track down and i don't necessarily that's not like a tongue-in-cheek way of saying pirate although occasionally that might happen but generally speaking i'm able to track down or you know youtube dl or something uh something that doesn't exist anywhere else or doesn't exist in in a way that's easily replaceable and so on and so forth so i think for your purposes and and i don't mean to sound dismissive i apologize if i do but for your purposes i agree with you what you're doing is the right approach for me it's not quite so simple because not only do i have a lot of media that's not easily not easy to replace but i'm often tweaking that media so i'm adding chapters or doing this or doing that and so that's part of the reason why i am going through this ridiculous amount of administrivia and headache to maintain my plex library because as ridiculous as it probably seems and maybe is it does provide me an immense amount of joy and it is not easy for me to just replace. Like John, you said a minute ago, Oh, I can just get this stuff back from other sources. A lot of the stuff I have in Plex, I could, but not all of it. And I would be devastated if I lost it. It's not so much that I can't get the stuff back. It's that I, I do tend my Plex library a little bit. Like I put custom artwork on some things because I didn't like the default ones. I messed with the metadata. I have 17 versions of star Wars that I kind of have to hand roll (laughs) because you know, Plex just knows about star Wars, but then I got all the different versions and I want them labeled and you know, like, and if I if it went away and I lost that, it's like, oh, well, you can get those things back. But now I have to go and retend that garden. I have to yep, yep, yep. Put, fig, remember, where did I find that good artwork that I like this? Did I save a little subfolder of like Synology custom artwork on my Mac or did I not do that? You know, how did I set up the metadata for these different versions of Star Wars so they're all set up correctly? You know, just how do I recreate the folder structure the right way? Like, it's not just the data. It's the it's the tending to it. The same thing with like my photo library. I Worst case scenario, like I have my photos backed up a million times, including to Google Photos again, but Google Photos doesn't have any of my metadata about it, and I would be devastated to lose all that metadata. So part of me backing up my, you know, iCloud photo library a thousand times is because I never want to lose all of the work that I have poured into tending that particular garden of, you know, tagging photos and editing them and cropping them and putting them into albums and sub albums and the smart folders and like, you know, keywords and like, that's time I've invested into this library. It's not a lot of data. That metadata is probably like, you know, less than 100 megabytes or something, but that is the most important part of it. Yes, obviously you want the, the photos themselves, which is why in the end, my backstop against my backstop against my backstop is, <laughs> you know, oh, at least I still have the photos and that's better than, you know, that's what you really want. 
But I, the, the real thing that would devastate me if I still had the photos is if I lost all that metadata. I do less tweaking to Plex. There's probably enough customization that one day worth of banging my head against it, I could get it back to the way I wanted it. But I don't want to spend that day. So yeah, I just back it all up. Um, yeah, and I, and the, the good thing about network attack storage is for me anyway, it's a big noisy thing, but it's in my basement. I never hear it. I never see it. It backs up to B2 with me having, not having to do anything and it just runs and it's been running for 10 years with no problems. Yeah, I cannot say enough good things about Synology. And that's why, as cheap as I am, I will at some point, either because I'll be forced to or because I'm finally being proactive, I will be buying another one. Now, maybe it won't be 8-bay, maybe it'll be 6, because, you know, drives are getting bigger, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I haven't really looked into it. But I will be getting... But here's the thing I'm telling you. Like, you can... My setup here was about $1,000 total for 18 terabytes of RAID 1. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. And I have two extra bays for the future if I really need that. But, like... The drives are so big. The The days of any of the three of us needing a six bay NAS are over. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, when I look at them, I also look at new Synologies and I think b- because storage is so cheap, I think both Casey and I are of the mind that if we had like 10 times more space, we can think of things to use it for. Oh, heck yes. <laughs> you know? that's the thing, I really can't. Like, that's why I, that's why I went this direction. Like, I like I looked at you know what what is my my personal like slice of the archive drive like you know Tiff's is a little bit bigger because she she has more of the family photos like from from big events and stuff but my slice of the archive drive is like one and a half terabytes so I just copied those files onto my laptop in a folder called archive <laughs> and <laughs> it fit you know I I have less free space now but I still it still fit just fine and so now that's okay this is just primary storage now archive is simply a you know, a filing system as opposed to, uh, not a file system, a, a, a filing system concept <laughs> as opposed to, like, you know, a, a physical distinction of how it is stored. Yeah. No, I, again, I, I don't mean to sound dismissive. I think for the purposes that you are talking about, I think you made the exact right choice. And and I'm glad that hashtag Casey was right and that you should have and did eventually end up with a Synology. So what we're learning over the last month or so on ETP is that I need to listen to you more. You need to listen to me more. <laughs> and probably neither of those things is going to end up happening. That's okay. All right, so now that we're 40 minutes in, you want to start the show? <laughs> Directed by Marco Arment. We are sponsored this week by Linode, my favorite place to run my servers. Visit linode.com slash ATP. See why Linode has been voted the top infrastructure as a service provider by both G2 and TrustRadius. I run all of my servers at Linode. These are wonderful virtual cloud servers that, frankly, it offers every feature you can possibly imagine. So obviously there's you know all the benefits of virtual servers. You can move them around to different hardware. You can resize them up and down in resource needs. All sorts of you know protections and conveniences available there. But what it comes down to for me for Linode is first of all, amazing performance. Like, they have really high-end hardware. They are one of the first hosts to go all SSD, and they they just are always leading the way in terms of performance of, you know, what you get on those cloud instances. And they also just have a really great, you know, infrastructure around it. They have an amazing control panel. They have amazing, you know, tools and API to automate stuff. They have great support if you ever need it. And all of that is wrapped up in an incredible value proposition. That's what I love the most about them, that frankly, they are the best value in the business that I have found. And I've, I've been with them for almost a decade now. And they've been the best value the entire time. Because ev- as technology gets better, they always stay competitive. They will give you more for your money or they'll, they'll introduce even lower cost plans. It's just great being a Linode customer. I run a lot of servers. Or all of my servers that I run are run on Linode. And I, I think I have something like 35 instances total so far. <laughs> and it's, it's just a wonderful web host. I, I strongly, strongly recommend if you need to run a server somewhere, go to Linode. They will probably have what you need and they'll do a really great job of it. So go to linode.com slash ATP, create a free account and you get $100 in credit. Once again, linode.com slash ATP. Make a free account today to get $100 in credit. Thank you so much to Linode for being an awesome host and for sponsoring our show. Do you have the XDR yet? (laughs) No. No, I do have I do have a new desk set up though, which we can talk about and will talk about in just a few minutes. But uh, but no, I do not have an XDR yet. I have not purchased an XDR yet. Uh, my desk setup is ever changing, but no, nothing yet. Uh, but we have to start with a little bit of housekeeping, I suppose. And one of you would like to talk about lithium batteries and smoke detectors. Yeah, Andrew on Twitter pointed us to a Consumer Reports article uh, 
counteracting our advice uh, from past shows that say you can use these really cheap lithium nine volt batteries, really long lasting nine volt uh, batteries in your smoke detectors because they last much longer than alkalines uh, and you don't have to change them as often. Here's what Consumer Reports has to say. Lithium nine volts aren't recommended for smoke detectors unless you follow a strict battery replacement schedule. Those batteries maintain a high voltage until the end of their usable life, so they provide a much shorter low battery warning to alert you that it's time to swap in a fresh one. Alkaline batteries, by comparison, have a more gradual voltage drop-off, prolonging the low battery alert and greatly increasing the odds that you'll be nearby to get the alert. So here's Consumer Reports doing a very bad job of what is their basic job, right? So this is their advice. <laughs> hey, just don't use lithium 9 volts, all right? And here's why, right? But there is no sort of quantifiable information. Okay, so you'll have less time to hear the beeping. The whole idea is that the smoke alarms beep when the voltage gets too low, right? So if you can graph the voltage of a battery over time, there's some threshold after which the, the smoke detector starts beeping, and you can imagine lots of differently shaped curves. The, the question is, like, how long, if you, don't, if you ignore an alkaline battery, you know, in your smoke detector and it starts beeping, how long would it beep? Say you're on vacation for a month. It starts beeping, beeping the second you walk out the door. When you come back a month from now, is it still beeping? How long does an alkaline battery beep in your smoke detector? A day? A week? A month? Two months? We don't know. And also, how long does a lithium beep in your smoke detector? 30 seconds? One minute? Does it beep once and never again? Or does it beep for <laughs> one week instead of two? <laughs> I can't make an informed decision about whether or not I should use lithium 9-volt batteries in my smoke detector without knowing how short is the low battery warning. Yes, you might be out of the house when it beeps, but I would like to know, does it beep for 30 seconds? Or does it beep for three days instead of two days? Or you know, instead of two weeks or whatever, like... That's an important question. And they do touch on, okay, if you have a battery replacement schedule and you just put a reminder for, you know, every year replace all the smoke detector batteries on, you know, whatever we set the clocks back or whatever, uh, you won't have a problem with this. But this advice, I wanted to put on the show because we did recommend to use these lithium 9 volts. We want you to know that apparently there is a potential problem, but I can't quantify that problem or know how seriously to take it. Because A, it's Consumer Reports and they have weird opinions on stuff. And B, they don't tell me how much shorter it's going to be. Because that is the most important fact in deciding whether this is important advice that I should definitely follow or advice that I can ignore. Yeah, because like, there's, there's an obvious trade-off. You know, like, there's, like if, you, if a lithium battery lasts like two or three times longer than an alkaline battery, if, if you're optimizing for time the smoke alarm is working, uh, then that's a pretty big benefit. And then, so you have to weigh that, like, it, depending on how, you know, as I was saying, like, we don't know, like, how much shorter is the beeping window? Who knows? There's no data here. So this sounds like the kind of thing that, like, you know, sometimes established people with established mindsets have a hard time adjusting to new things and try to immediately disregard or discredit some kind of new option as, ah, you can't do that. It's not safe. Or, it's not the way we used to do it. You know. And that kind of attitude often is the cause of myths and, and you know, quote, wisdom that is not true um, spreading around. And this sounds a lot like that kind of thing to me. It, it, I, there is actual science that in the sense that lithium-based batteries do have, like, higher nominal voltages than alkalines. Um, I think. I, I think they're slightly above 1.5. And, like, things that try to detect their battery level based on the assumptions of alkaline battery voltages will often not detect it correctly in either lithiums or going the other direction if you put in rechargeables. Like, the rechargeable uh, nickel metal hydride batteries that everyone uses in most things, like rechargeable AA's and everything, those have a lower nominal voltage than AA's. So when you put those in something, I think those are 1.2 or 1.3 volts instead of 1.5. Uh, off the top of my head, I, I could be wrong, but it's, you know, it's lower. And so... When you put those in something, oftentimes it will think it, you have a low battery even when you don't. And then those also have a different kind of curve of like when they fall off. Like alkaline batteries fall off kind of gradually. Uh, nickel metal hydride, I think, has a little bit flatter of a curve. And then lithium has a much flatter curve. Or lithium will stay at a high voltage level until pretty close to the end, which is the problem they're, they're citing here. But anyway, this claim about a safety issue with lithiums, I think, needs more information to, to be backed up here. Um, but if you're actually that concerned about your smoke alarm safety, you should get the ones that are that have the new like permanent built in 10 year lithium batteries. And then when they die and they're designed for lithiums, so they probably have, you know, the correct voltage curve uh, adjusted for in their in their beepiness. Um, <laughs> when they die, you replace the whole thing like that's that's the currently 
best recommended practice for smoke alarms in your house. And that way you get all new sensors and everything in addition to a new battery when you get a new unit. So if you're really that concerned about safety, do that. And otherwise, if, if you're going to you know replace your 9 volts in, the, in your existing smoke alarms, I still think lithiums are fine. And honestly, you should probably replace the whole smoke detector, especially if it's in like an area like near the kitchen where like greasy smoke and stuff can accumulate out. After 10 years, even if the battery's not dead, it's probably a good idea to get a new one. We are sponsored this week by Mac Weldon, my favorite and most worn brand of clothing. The holiday season is here, and with it come the yearly questions, what do I wear to non-ugly sweater parties? How do I maximize my time savoring holiday moments and minimize my time shopping for gifts? So fear not, Mac Weldon has your answers. Whether it's an office party or family gathering or just you, your couch, and a game on TV, Mac Weldon has all the essentials to keep you stylish and comfortable throughout the season. And their innovative daily wear system has taken the hard work out of outfit planning with pieces designed to work together for any occasion, saving you time and sparing you any extra holiday day stress. Mac Weldon stuff frankly is amazing. I have been wearing their stuff heavily for years. I wear their underwear every single day. I wear their t-shirts most days. I have almost I have one of almost everything they make and I have way more than one of my favorite things. I have you know, something like 20 pairs of underwear. I guess I have their socks. They make wonderful like boot knit socks uh, for the winter. They're really nice. Their warm knit long sleeve uh, tees and, and other items are really, really nice for the winter. I always love their silver line. I'm wearing one of their silver t-shirts right now. This morning when I was working out, I was wearing their ace sweatpants, which are or their ace sweat shorts rather because it was a very, very heavy workout today. And I was wearing another one of their shirts for workouts and and it is just a fantastic system. I love Mack Weldon stuff. It's all really great quality. It holds up over the years, and it, it fits great from day one to, you know, year five. And it's, it's just fantastic. So see for yourself at MacWeldon.com slash ATP podcast, and you can get 20% off your first order with promo code ATP podcast. That's MacWeldon.com slash ATP podcast, promo code ATP podcast for 20% off your first order. Mac Weldon, get it right this holiday season. All right, let's go to Casey's Corner, and I'm not talking about the uh, restaurant at Walt Disney World. I have a whole bunch of hopefully quick follow-up. Wait, there's a restaurant at Disney called Casey's Corner? Mm-hmm. Well, sure is. They serve hot dogs and uh, other things of the like. It's uh, delicious. Do they serve, like, Velveeta? <laughs> Boar's Head American Cheese, White American, yeah. And now, uh, you know... Can you <laughs> that would be focus? incredible. Vel- Velveeta shells and cheese. Uh, I actually have uh, several pictures of me in front of it, um, which if I remember, which I won't, I will give you one for this chapter of the show notes, but I will surely forget. Nevertheless... You, you, inspire, uh, you inspired my wife to get Boar's Head White American Cheese at the store oh, the other week. it's yeah. good. And? I, I always liked it. I've liked it my whole life. It's good. I ate it. Good. See? I'm telling you. Yeah. yeah. I'm still a yellow American person, but otherwise, but I, I, I admit the white American is very good as well. There you go. See, now that is useful follow-up. That is what I like to hear. All right, so let's talk That's about... The, is, it, is this the only food and drink opinion that the three of us share? That might be, actually. <laughs> we, we, we all find Boar's Head American cheese acceptable. <laughs> Thumbs up. That you, I know, actually, that, no, really and truly, I think you might be onto something. This Do might we be, all like water, too? Eh. Not distilled, Mark Allen. Yeah, <laughs> too soon, <laughs> too soon. Two, two of you have a, a fraught relationship with water. We do. Mo- me more so than Marco, but both of us now. All right. So hey, uh, the LG uh, Screen Manager app, which is this piece of garbage <laughs> app that you can install on a Mac in order to update the firmware on your LG Ultrafine 5K. Uh, as we discussed a show or two ago, that only successfully worked on Intel Macs, and as of the last day or two, it now works on M1 Macs. Which which is great. And that was via uh, Dave Stachowiak uh, via Twitter. Uh, so we'll put that link into the show notes. If you have an LG 5K or presumably 4K, you can check that out uh, if you have an M1 Mac. Now let's talk about my LG. Uh, it is no longer in the house. Oh. After nine days of pestering LG, I have finally <laughs> gotten a RMA and it is finally on its way back to LG. Thankfully, the repair center is super close. Let me see where it is. Oh, City of Industry, California. So now this thing is going to tra- probably go on a truck all the way to California to probably sit for three weeks until someone is available to look at it, only to pro- probably tell me that the thing is back ordered. And then eventually, in a month or two or seven, I might have uh, my Ultrafine 5K back. And it might even work then. And it might even work then. So that'll be the test. What will be, o- what will be over first, my monitor drama or the pandemic? I'm 
probably going to go in favor of the pandemic at this point, and I realize how bold that is. Nevertheless. You can end your monitor drama tomorrow. Oh, stop. Stop. Well, I sort of have, and we'll get there in a second. So uh, just to show you how great LG service is, uh, I had an online chat with them on Monday the 6th, which actually was fairly easy and delightful. I didn't get a lot of flack about what I wanted. I didn't have to like, ins- uh, you know, assure, insure them that I've plugged it in and blah, blah, blah. Like they, they were, it was pretty sure. Take a video of your monitor. Not no, worrying. no, no. Didn't have to take a video of my monitor. Nothing like that. Uh, but they said, Hey, here's the deal. And I think I spoke about this last week. Uh, we need $150 from you in order to do the repair and we're not going to collect <laughs> Wait, that via an online chat. No, so th- in order to do the repair, they wanted 150 bucks up front. I think I said this last week. So you're and, spending and, even more money on the LG now. This is correct. Yes. You might as well buy a boat. It's like just throwing oh, more money. It just <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. But no, I, I really, I have faith. I truly honestly have faith that sometime between now and when I'm dead, this thing will come back to me and work properly. But nevertheless. I will agree that it will most likely come back to you. Oh, gosh. So I, I'm going to be so furious. I, in fact, I, if I'm smart, I won't bring it up if it comes back and it's not working. Please, future Casey, don't say now, anything listen, to Marco. I, I, I'm telling you, the LG 5K is like the butterfly keyboard. Mm. They can maybe repair it and send it back to you, but it's not going to be flawless for in a reliable way for, for an indefinite amount of time. Like oh, there's, a, oh, there's a high chance that something about it will flake out again. We'll see. Hopefully not. But nevertheless, so very quickly, on Monday the 6th, I have an online chat. They say, okay, we're going to call you in two to three days so we can take your money. I said, great. On Friday the 10th, they haven't called yet, so I had another online chat. Oh, yes, yes, yes. We will absolutely (laughs) call you as soon as possible to take your money. Great. On Tuesday the 14th, I said, guys, please, can we please call me and take my money? All I want in the world is for you to take my money. Please end this. Please and thank you. Can can we all buy you an XDR so we can stop talking about it? Yes. Yes. If you want to buy me an XDR, (laughs) I will gladly accept it. I am not buying one. I am not volunteering for this. (laughs) (laughs) If Marco would like to volunteer his tribute, so be it. So uh, anyway, so on the 14th, I get on the online chat again. So finally, I speak to the last person that I end up speaking to, and that individual who is very kind said, in so many words, I'm the person that's in charge of, like, scheduling refrigerator in, like, TV repairs. (laughs) There is no chance I'm going to be taking $150 of your money over the phone in order to get a monitor repaired. I don't even know why they sent me to you, or sent you to me. But anyways, (laughs) so... I was like, okay. Why? Why are you putting yourself through this? Because now I have to see it through. I'm not a goddamn quitter, Marco. Quit this monitor. You have to quit this monitor. (laughs) This is sunk cost fallacy. Come on, just get out. Get out of this situation. No, no, it's going to be okay. Run from this monitor. It's It's not worth it. It's so (laughs) not worth it. So, but it was so nice when it was worth it. Isn't your time worth anything? (laughs) Well, apparently not. So eventually I do get a call back from a very delightful lady who said, I will take $150 of your money, please. I said, yes, absolutely. And so she immediately sent me a shipping label and I dropped the LG 5K off at FedEx this morning to go to City of Industry to hopefully get repaired. So I don't. she said, in a best case scenario, you know, it's probably going to be like a week to get there, a week or so getting repaired and a week back, which Say I haven't looked at a calendar, but that's like, what, the first half of January? I will bet that there is a 50-50 shot I see this thing before Valentine's Day. And even that I'm not particularly confident in, obviously. So we'll see what happens. So just for the record, mm-hmm. I know the XDR is expensive. I know. I've said it. That's, no, no. It looks back at expensive and says, ha, huh, remember how cheap expensive was? I'm ludicrous. Fair enough. However... LG's service is awful. It has always been awful. And one of the things you get when you buy something nice from Apple is most of the time, and they're not perfect all the time, but most of the time, a way better service experience if you need it. This is ridiculous. Like, the the, the hoops that you're jumping through to try to get what is, you know, in in absolute terms still a pretty premium priced monitor yeah, yeah to yeah. get warranty serviced oh no it's out of warranty which is part of the problem but sorry well to get serviced by its manufacturer yep, yep yep it's that's still a ridiculous amount of hoops to jump through and a huge amount of time to be without it people buy tools for their work and they need them to work and like this is one of the things you know when i was when i was you know younger and didn't have money and and you know, I would, I would, I thought I was, you know, uh, uh, you know, a hotshot who knew everything, and everything I didn't understand was stupid. Wait, you and thought that 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 stopped? <laughs> that's you know, that, that, that's called that's called being smart and twenty. You know, like that's 
that's no, what enough, that enough. feeling is. And and so, uh, you know, I would look at things like, you know, enterprise grade servers and stuff like that. And I'd be like, my God, those computers are so expensive. What idiot would pay that premium price for like, you know, that Dell workstation when I could build, uh, you know, a, a very similar or identically performing computer for less money? And so I did. And God, I spent and wasted so much time <laughs> building and then repairing and fixing and trying to get to work custom built computers for me and my friends like through, throughout all of high school and college so many hours down the drain but we didn't have much money and so that trade-off made sense but i never understood why people would buy the expensive things well now that i'm like a business and an adult <laughs> it makes sense if if i'm using this thing as a tool for all of my income I can spend a little bit more, you know, this is where the, the phrase like throw money at the problem to make it go away, right? Mm -hmm. If I can throw money at this problem and make it totally go away, that is often worth doing because these problems are not worth the massive amount of time and hassle and, and potential risk of like, this thing might just die one day when you when you really need it to be working. You know, if you're working on something really important, this thing might just die and you're just screwed. And if when something does die, it takes you like a week of effort to even get them to start the repair and then you might see it back again in a month that is not suitable for professional use simple as that like and that's why professionals in professional environments when they can afford it get nicer gear that has better support better reliability and better service when you need it and in this case you're just make you're making the case for the XDR over and over again every single week. <laughs> He's making the case against the LG 5K, not necessarily for a six thousand uh, dollar monitor that's been uh, surpassed by the laptop monitors. It it pained me so much to order this goddamn expensive monitor. It really did. Uh, but my monitor problem has been totally gone since then. Zero issues. I'm totally happy with it, regardless of what John says. And we'll talk about the rumors in a second. I am not at all like feeling FOMO about like, oh God, what if what if I'm going to miss the new? No, we thing we, or... we bought ours at the right time. We bought them when they were the the when when it, their price made the most possible sense. Well, you, it never made that much sense, but you but bought, made you most, bought yours at, you, at the best time if, when it was brand new. <laughs> yeah, if you look at the if you look at the slope of how much sense does this monitor make at this price, it's going down <laughs> real fast now. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't right. say fast, but anyway. So the point is. One of the reasons it's so expensive, yeah, it is a ridiculous price and it is a ridiculous thing, but you do get a lot for that. Whether it's worth it to you or not, that's up to you and everyone else. But like for me, if I if if my LG monitor that I was depending on every day, if it died one day, I wouldn't even bother contacting them because I I've done I've dealt with LG warranty support in the past. I, it's always been terrible. As far as I'm concerned, if the LG monitor dies, I would just put it in a closet, forget about it forever, and just get it. I, I would overnight myself a replacement and keep working. <laughs> Well, I understand what you're saying. And that's the other thing, actually, is even if I wanted a brand new LG, they're back ordered for like a, a month or two. Why? Because there's no other options. Well, there's one. Nevertheless. <laughs> well, there's one. So, so he, I have settled on a new desk setup, which will hopefully persist until if and until and when and if I ever get that 5K back. And so I have the 24-inch 4K not ultrafine LG monitor that I was using literally four years ago at work, no, three years ago at work, uh, that I had borrowed um, from my good friend at my old job. And then I don't know if I mentioned it on the air or not, but I actually order, ordered one of those as well before I even spoke to the friend because I figured, oh, there's no way he's just going to let me buy or much less borrow one of these monitors. Um, so I'm just going to order one and I'll use, you know, one of these 24-inch 4Ks and, and the onboard laptop screen. What, speaking of orders, didn't you order a new LG 5K? And you're like, oh, I, I don't think I'm going to cancel that order yet. That's the last we heard of it. Did you cancel yeah, that I order? Did, I did cancel it, I think, around the time that the LG, the, the one that I had. Do you, do you had, regret canceling it now? A little bit, yes. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I have, I, uh, I had ordered. You know what's better than one mediocre finicky monitor? Two of them. Well, it would be right. a, brand, a brand new one that maybe would be less finicky because who knows why and by the way you're talking about it here's my new desk setup again i would petition for a a uh, photo to be shoved into the slack so at least we can see it and, and so i can also point out all the the liquids that are 
<laughs> threatening your setup. <laughs> All right, you know what? I will. I will do it right now. So now you're going to have to vamp because I will do it right now, and I will not touch the water. I will show you exactly what my situation is. So hold on, you two right, vamp. Yep, yep. Plenty of time, Marco. Marco will edit this out, and then we can. Yep. While you do that, we can discuss which part of Marco's adult businessman brain decided I'm going to start a jug of water next to the computers <laughs> in my closet. In my defense, those were stored there at very different times. And when, I, when you're an important businessman, you realize don't do risky things like make your own computer. It could cause problems. <laughs> but, so mean. I have a jug of water. You're what so should I do mean. with it? How about up high in the electronics closet? <laughs> <laughs> you need some adult supervision over there. I don't know what you're doing in that office. You're probably on Wi-Fi right now. I did this with the wide, uh, the wide. Uh, the, the, I did this with a wide angle lens, so it's probably not the crispest or the brightest, but it should be going through. Now. Oh, I forgot you. You sit in darkness. No, actually, the overhead light is on. It's just it's, it's, it's it's a great thing with, the, with your glass desk that we can see the cable mess right through it. Like every oh, time yeah, you look at your desk, desk, you're like, "Oh, there's my bad cable management." Yep, still it's, there. It, it's an absolute disaster. I'll be the first to tell you. But um, so yeah, so what I have now. Wait, hold if on. You're, uh, okay, so first he of does all, have a water. What are you doing? You have <laughs> it's way over to the side. <laughs> yeah, so was mine. Nothing. Mine was in the you corner. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you have, on the, you have an oh. on-air sign, but it's off, and we're on the air. You, if that spills, <laughs> like, the USB Pre-2 is right there, which is like a $700 box that does not like water. The keyboard is there, whatever, but you already said there's like 100 and something, right? The laptop is up on a little stand, but it's like, it's learned its lesson. It's, it's on an iMac stand. Isn't that an iMac yes, stand? Yes, it is. It is, actually. Okay, at, so least, let, at least it's on, on something. It's like, it's like someone, you know, scared of a mouse in a kitchen going up on a stool. That's what but I can we describe. It's hanging Please. over the side by like four inches. <laughs> Yes. Well, all right. Nobody's perfect. So here's the thing. So what I've got, I do have my glass desk, which eventually I will replace. But have we mentioned I'm cheap? So uh, d- directly. Wait, where's in front the iPad me, that this Apple Pencil belongs to? It's uh, nowhere. Uh, charging behind me. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I think one of the kids removed the pencil and dropped it on my desk, and I haven't had a chance to put it back on the iPad. But all right. So let me describe this picture that I took that you will probably not see because my whole situation is a mess. But I'll describe it to you. So I have my glass desk centered directly in front of me is is one of these LG 24 inch 4K monitors. This is the one that I actually bought and I told myself I was going to return like I'd never opened it for a week and a half or something like that. And I said, you know, I'll just return it because I'll just live off of the borrowed monitor until the LG comes in. And uh, this thing was like 300 bucks, which is not a small amount of money, but is really not that much money in the grand scheme of things. And that's 27 inches at 4K? 24 inches at 4K, which strictly speaking isn't retina, uh, if you look at the number, like the PPI numbers, but for my crap eyes, it is absolutely retina, without question. I would say that is, that is the, that is like the upper edge, because like back, back in the olden days, 24 inch monitors when they first came out were 1920 by 1200 and 4k is it, roughly depending on some details but roughly double that it, it's the, it's exactly. the roughly retina mm-hmm. version of that so you yep, know yep, yep. later on you know towards the tail end of 1x monitors being normal in, in mac land they did get more dense and that 1920 across resolution shrunk down to like 21 and a half inches for the imac in the same way that like the 2560 across was first in the 30 inch Apple monitor and then later on was put in 27s. So I would say going, going, you know, quote back to the 1920 point across monitor at 24 inches, while it is not today's version of Retina, it is like close enough. It, it, it's within yep. the, the realm of what we expect as Mac users. Absolutely. So that's centered in front of me. And then to my right, at, you know, at like a 45 degree angle, is the borrowed equivalent, the exact same monitor, just the borrowed version. Um, and that's off to the right. And then to my left, on a riser that was designed for the sta- the base of the iMac and is obviously and thus a little too small for the MacBook Pro. But nonetheless, here it is. Uh, on the riser is my MacBook Pro in clamshell at the moment. And so I've got two identical 4K monitors basically directly in front of me. Uh, for the record, my water is all the way to the right, as far away from my hand is, as it can possibly be. You know what water can do across a flat surface, especially one made of glass? It can travel because it's it all can. the same level. But it, and it's, and it's, a, it's an Aquafina bottle that's been you know, recycled in the sense that it doesn't have Aquafina water in it. It has tap water in it now, but it has a lid on it. And the lid always stays on it unless I'm actively drinking. So, uh, you know, I'm doing the best I can here, fellas. But... I wonder if maybe the solution to John's water anxiety is sloped desks. <laughs> that's uh, that's going to cause more problems. Or what if what if you use an air hockey table as a desk? Now you got yeah. stuff sliding out. It's not that difficult. No, but you have like, all the holes, need, all the drain holes. You just need a surface, a surface Jeez, around that it. same place that is like three inches lower. My next desk is going to be an air hockey table. Uh, uh, right? By the way, you're a, you're a, 
your laptop being on the iMac stand, none of the feet of that laptop are in contact with the stand, right? Uh, correct. So it's just metal on metal. Oh, no. no there's a little, there's, no, 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 no. The stand has like a little pad on it. There's some right. metal on metal, but the stand does have a little pad oh, on the top. Oh, God. <laughs> you can do like a tray table. You have tray tables in your house. Just put a tray table next to your computer. Yeah. All right. I'll get right then on. And you that. can put but, like a whole meal on that tray table, and when it mm, spills, it just goes to the floor, and nothing on your desk gets any right. of the liquid. Well, you can't really see in this picture because it's terrible. But there's a filing cabinet directly to the left of. Yeah, the, just roll um, that out a little. Yeah. Well, that I could, but I always put junk on there. That's like my landing area, as you can tell in this picture. It's my landing area for the office. Nevertheless, uh, I get I get some I get some lights in this room next time. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, I bring all this up to say right now my setup is two of these identical, uh, I'll put the model number in the show notes, I forget what it is offhand, but two of these identical 4K monitors, each of them is $300 on Amazon, which again is not cheap, but given what you're getting is actually really not that bad. The monitors are not great. They are fine. They're too <laughs> low on this desk. I'll be the first to tell you they're too low. I was thinking about that earlier today. I need to figure out a way to br- raise them up because in typical LG fashion, the stand sucks, but it's Fine. And the, and the thing is, and the reason I bring all this up is because to my eyes and to my wallet, 600, like even if I bought both of these, $600 for two 4K monitors, it is not what I would prefer, but it is absolutely not 10 times worse than the 10 times more expensive uh, the Pro Display XDR. Like I just can't get, I don't think I would get 10x the. I, I, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, joy, uh, the return out of a $6,000 Pro Display XDR that I am off of this not perfect, but other ultimately pretty serviceable $600 setup. And that's why I keep digging in my heels because it just, I can't justify 10X what I've got right now. I just can't. Now, if somebody else wants to literally buy me one, I will absolutely accept your Pro Display XDR. But I, and if it was like a couple thousand dollars, I probably would. But at four or five or six thousand dollars, <laughs> I just can't bring myself to do it. And, and and I actually don't disagree with you, Marco. I really truly don't like everything you said. Logically, I one thousand percent agree with you. I just cannot bring myself to open my wallet for six thousand dollars. I just can't do it. So that is my new desk setup. Uh, and related to that. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that now I'm running out of ports on this computer, which I actually have a dock coming, um, from someone coming, coming my way in the next few days. But with that said, I currently have plugged in one, uh, of the monitors via HDMI, one via USB-C to display port. I have the mix pre three. I have a, uh, ethernet adapter and I have MagSafe. So I am using every one of the ports on this computer right now, which I'm glad that this computer has as many ports as it does. And that brings me to a tip. Uh, I forget who it was that wrote in, but I had read a few nights ago, and then somebody wrote in the next morning, uh, that you can actually do 60 hertz uh, via HDMI, which I previously erroneously said was not possible on these uh, monitors. The thing is, you have to engage HDMI Ultra HD Deep Color, because when I think of refresh rate, I think deep color. Does that screw with their color reproduction? Because a lot of a lot of You displays, think I notice? Yeah. Well, televisions and some displays have a mode in which they can accept your signal and say, but actually, we the, like the color gamut of the monitor is wider in some areas than the color gamut of whatever this thing is supposed to be displayed. It's more important for TVs because TVs, like things are mastered in a certain color space. And for accurate reproduction, that color space should be shown on the TV within the color space that the thing is mastered at. But the TV is like, but actually, I've got more colors than that. Don't you want me to just take that image and expand it to, to fill the whole color space? And it makes everything look all like candy colored when it shouldn't be. And the only reason that's relevant to your computer is if you're looking at pictures and you're trying to like adjust them and everything looks all candy colored and you're like, oh, I got to try to dim it down. But then you look at it on an actual device that shows it within whatever color space that, you know, photo like sRGB or Adobe, you know, whatever RGB. If you see it accurate, you just realize you've changed your picture in a way that you don't like. So it's not not that you care like super duper professional, but if you're ever doing anything with photos on it, you want what you see on the screen to reflect the reality and not to be some, you know, ultra HD deep color thing where the monitor is disregarding the color space or expanding the color space for you. 
Yeah, I, I can't say I've noticed one way or the other. Uh, I, but again, I I do have a discerning eye about some things and clearly a discerning ear because I can tell you all about how great vinyl is. <laughs> but, uh, but this is not one of those things. And so if you happen to have one of these monitors, for what it's worth, menu, picture, picture adjust, HDMI ultra deep color. And if you do that, you can use an HDMI cable and do 60 hertz at 4K. I will say not about color, but I could swear like... Something about the anti-aliasing is different. I, I couldn't tell you what, and this is, again... You're running at a native resolution, so there wouldn't be any... I agree. I just it, Something felt different to me, but I can't put my finger on it. I'm probably bananas. Is the, is the sub-pixel arrangement different on these monitors? I mean, possibly, but I... Well, no, 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 beca- no, because what I was doing was I was switching between DisplayPort and HDMI on the same actual monitor. And, mm. I, and I felt like it looked different, but there was enough l- delay between the switching of the two that... I, I think the, the, the signaling... HDMI, someone just wrote in about this. Because you were, they were saying how you were complaining that using DisplayPort and it made you feel like it was a gross and ancient. But I think what you meant is you were using an older DisplayPort connector and that felt old. But the DisplayPort protocol is more modern and more computer focused than HDMI for can you find that email so I don't just make this up something about HDMI mixing chroma and luminance in the thing would uh, display port has them uh, more cleanly separated I don't know anyway uh, that that could explain the difference in that like you're getting worse picture quality because of some HDMI thing yeah and I mean it's it's certainly within the realm of of acceptable like it's it's not bad by any stretch of the imagination but it is it, it I felt I felt like I was noticing something although I couldn't really put my finger on exactly what it was and uh, nevertheless this is workable this is what I think I'm going to stick with at least until the 5K comes back or until somebody literally donates <laughs> <laughs> the art of me, which I'm not I'm not actually advocating for the love of all that is good and holy. I can afford one if I really wanted to. I just really, really, really don't want to. Uh, and for the record, this is an LG 24UD58-B, 24-inch 4K UHD IPS monitor with FreeSync, comma black, as per Amazon. So that, uh, and there's only 16 left in stock, so go fast. Um, but anyways, so that, that's what I'm doing. And uh, also one other quick bit of follow-up. Uh, I'd been complaining a little while ago about my Magic Mouse, my brand new Magic Mouse, feeling weird with my brand new uh, M1 Max MacBook Pro. And it felt like, I think I said a week or two ago, it felt like almost as though the the Bluetooth connection was sleeping too soon. I have no evidence to, to, to prove my theory, but it felt like it was going into some sort of like low power mode too quickly. And Monterey 12.1 has come out since I last spoke about it, and I think it has made it mostly better. There's also been, I forget who pointed this out to me, but somebody pointed out a tweet from Charity Majors who uh, has a defaults right that you can try that um, that apparently disables mouse acceleration. I have not tried this yet because I think it's it's workable for me now that I don't have to plug in the mouse to make it feel like it's okay. Um, but it is something that I might try if I feel like it gets worse. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. I found the tweet. It doesn't have much more detail, but uh, Andreas Hardell says uh, about you talking about DisplayPort versus HDMI. Uh, he says, HDMI is based on DVI and mushes together all data in in a stream that still has the concept of blanking intervals. DisplayPort is more modern and packet-based. Video over Thunderbolt uses the DisplayPort protocol. Um, so that doesn't have much more information. Sorry, but that's what, that's what I was trying to remember. <laughs> all right. Well, I appreciate the try. All right, that's all for follow-up. Now for SKTP. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, this went, this went a little longer than... We've got one more monitor item, and now it's it, you know ostensibly a topic, but sure. Oh, yes, that's right. We do have that one more monitor item. How could I forget? So you are welcome, all of you, every single one of you. What can I say? But you're welcome. Because we heard a rumor today, uh, which was a short tweet thread, and then we'll put in a Mac Rumors post about it, that says, as per a uh, user, uh, Twitter user Dylan something or other, I, I don't know that they really have a last name, but nevertheless, uh, there are three LG-made displays, right, Dylan, uh, encased in unbranded enclosures for usage as external monitors that are in early development, two of which have the same specifications as the upcoming 27-inch and current 24-inch iMac displays. The other display seems to be an improved 32-inch Pro Display XDR. Despite the lack of branding, it can be assumed at the very least that this display will be Apple-branded. Okay, I mean, it's a little bit bold, but I'll go with it. Uh, Dylan continues, Interestingly enough, there seems to be a reference to custom silicon powering the 32-inch display. Sadly, no such references were found for the 27-inch or 24-inch displays with regards to custom silicon. Uh, and Dylan continues, finally, this, of course, does not rule out the possibility of custom silicon for these displays. It simply means that there's not sufficient data proving otherwise. Finally, the 32-inch and 27-inch monitors seem to have mini-LED displays at 120 hertz variable refresh rate. 
This is very exciting, except for one key word. Did you catch the key word that is making me very sad? Early development. Early. Mm -hmm. That does not make me happy at all. (sighs) Isn't it weird that, like, according to this rumor, again, this is just, I don't think there's much more in these rumors than we've seen in the past, because we've seen rumors for months now about Apple's making an external display with, with like, a, a, you know, a a system on a chip in it, you know, an A something inside there, whatever. But... The, the idea that one of these displays is the same as the one in the twenty current 24-inch iMac, correct me if I'm wrong, but the current 24-inch iMac screen is not high refresh and is not HDR, right? I don't, I, I don't know about HDR, but it's definitely not high refresh. I, I, it probably is HDR, in, at least in the old way, like before the micro-LED things that, that all the previous MacBook Pros um, and stuff had, where like they would just kind of overdrive the screen brightness. Is it not mini-LED as well? The uh, no, I, as far as I know, the the current like M1 iMac is not mini LED. It's 500 nits. Yeah, just looked it up. 24 inch iMacs are 500 nits. That is not HDR. Right. So all, all that be all this being said, if this information is correct about the products that are in development, that sounds perfectly great. Um, I'm actually kind of surprised they would they would sell a smaller monitor, um, but certainly the 27 inch uh, and you know assu- assuming that you know the the whatever the updated XDR is, is probably going to be similarly priced. Um, and, you know, we talked before about the 27-inch. If, if they do 27-inch 120 hertz and mini LED, that's going to be probably a fairly expensive display. Um, and so it's it would be nice then to also have that 24-inch option, although honestly I would want it to be bigger. I'd rather have, I'd rather have a 27-inch that doesn't have 120 hertz and mini LED Same. in the lineup. Um, but anyway... I, I see why they would do all three of these things, although I, I would also see why they would only choose to do the top two. Um, but this is also, you know, this is a random person on Twitter. And random people on Twitter who tweet Apple rumors don't have a strong track record. I'm not I'm not familiar with this particular person's track record, but I, I would not read this as gospel. Like, uh, until we have somebody who is reliable with this kind of thing somebody like ming chi kuo mark german like when they start claiming specifics and timelines those are way more reliable than twitter leakers and youtube leakers have been so far i think both of those people did have a external display with some kind of chip inside it rumor from many months ago right so and and the like having the chip inside of it they don't necessarily say what kind of chip it is. It's just a custom Apple chip. That could be a lot of things. That could be a timing controller. That that could be a display controller. That could that like that could be a lot of things that that is not like an M1 Pro running in the display. Like it 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 could be a lot of things. So I I don't think that necessarily means much with the information or lack thereof that we have. But um, the part of that about it being early development, that again that could be true. German said a display was in early development like a year ago. Well, when did they receive this, the, the information? Where did this information come from? Maybe they received old information, or maybe maybe they only saw evidence of early development because the evidence of the current development didn't leak out in that same way through the same channel. Getting any kind of timeline argument from this, I, I think, is is weak and unreliable. Like you know, it, it sounds like a lot of the um, a lot of this information is being derived from like software support somewhere or references that are in a library somewhere to different displays. So I wouldn't read too much into this. We have heard from multiple places for about a year that Apple is working on an external display, at least one that is going to sit below the XDR in the lineup. There is a lot of smoke to that fire. That's probably going to happen. We I don't think this information from this person today gives us anything really concrete to work to to work with that we didn't already have. I wouldn't assume that the that the you know the the twenty four inch proves to be a thing. I wouldn't assume that anything this person said that wasn't backed up by other sources over the last year would be a sure thing. It's all maybe. If this is true, that'd be great. Uh, you know the the timeline is not going to be what Casey wants. Um, But that would be a (laughs) great, you know, again, typical Apple fashion. They basically stopped working on the Mac from 2016 until about 2018. Uh, They they really did like almost nothing for the Mac in that time. Um, For whatever reason, history will eventually maybe tell us in some tell all books sometime. But it it certainly seems like they basically like turned off Mac development hardware wise for that time. There was this giant hole in the lineup. And they decided to fill it 
sometime in the last couple of years, I think, from what we can derive so far. And it takes some time to make stuff. And an external display is going to be way lower priority than things like, you know, fixing the Mac Pro fire they made for themselves and fixing the laptop fire they made for themselves. <laughs> like, these things are all, are all more important. And so if you only have a certain amount of engineering resources that you're willing to devote to the Mac and, and, and you know, certain teams you're going to move around to do it, like, the monitor is going to be last priority. Well, you say that, but all the other fires are out at this point, right? Like, yes, 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 Mac Pro. And, and actually, legitimately, the 27-inch iMac. But other than those two, which I would argue the Mac Pro is a smaller fire, what else is left, right? Like, in terms of Mac stuff, this is this is it. This is what they got to fix. Agreed. And, and I, I think that this is very likely to be a problem that Apple has decided to solve. When they decided to solve it is, you know, that's a question mark. And how quickly the result of that will come onto the market is another question mark. Whether the result will solve it is a third question mark. Uh, but it does seem like they are making an external monitor, at least at least one that is going to be lower than the XDR in, in the product line. Uh, but other than that, I don't think this gives us any new information at all. One quibble with what you had said earlier. I personally am not familiar with Dylan. Uh, what is this? Dylan DKT is the Twitter user. I have never seen this person before. But as per the summary on Mac rumors, uh, they write according to Twitter account, you know, Dylan uh, DKT, who has a mostly accurate track record with ac- Apple related rumors. I have no earthly idea what that track record is based on, what rumors this person has leaked. But according to Mac rumors, they seem to think that this person is not a complete dope. So take that for what you will. But the problem with this rumor, it says we found three displays, but and you can explain the use of those displays all in a context other than a new external display because a 24 inch, he already says it's the one they use in 24 inch iMac. Great. Well, so why do we care about that? Yes, there's a display used in the 24 inch iMac. Okay, maybe that's for a 24 inch iMac. Then there's a 27 inch one for the upcoming iMac. Okay, maybe that's display for the upcoming iMac, which is also not an external display. And then finally, 32 inch for the replacement for their one existing extremely high priced external monitor. So none of those, you know, hey, we found these display panels. None of those things necessarily say that there will be a new display that is not the XDR. All it says is we found one that might be for the new XDR and we found two other ones that are going into iMacs. Great. The other thing is that, you know, this this says that, you know, LG is d- is developing these things. And some of the, to some degree, you know, that is that is not as bad as it sounds because LG it makes the panels that Apple often uses in their large display computers. It's two, actually two different companies. So there's LG Display and LG Electronics. And the company you hate is LG Electronics because they make the monitor. LG Display makes the panels that, like, for example, LG Display makes the OLED panels that every single OLED TV maker uses. Sony uses them. Panasonic well, I uses know them. That. Right? And LG Display sells their panels to LG Electronics. And the, the relationship between LG Electronics and LG Display is surprisingly contentious, considering it's like same team. Like, for example, LG Display versus uh, LG Electronics have disagreements about whether or not we should, you know, move on to display technology XYZ. Like, what should we do next after OLED? Should we use QD OLED? Should we use go back to some weird LCD thing or whatever? There's very often debates between them as to what they actually want for their next television. So it's super weird over there. <laughs> um, so when, but when Apple's talking about Al- Apple is buying things from LG Display. They're not buying things from LG Electronics. But, of course, Apple does have some kind of relationship with LG Electronics because I think they kind of, like, essentially cajoled them into making the stupid 5K that we all love. Totally. And and <laughs> Apple does that, at least they did, that kind of relationship with lots of companies before. You know, especially um, in the last few years, Belkin has been the recipient of a lot of those kind of, yeah. like, seemingly, like, Apple contracts, possibly, uh, where Apple will kind of just you know, work it out with either Belkin or LG or somebody like that. Like, hey, we don't want to make, you know, USB to Ethernet adapters anymore. Just please you make one that follows these specs and we'll sell it in our stores and we'll, we'll you know, promote it. Like, and, and that's probably the arrangement they have with LG, probably something like that, LG Electronics, um, for for the Ultra Fines. I hope that LG in this rumor only refers to LG display because I I hope that Apple has realized, and I think they probably have, that outsourcing those you know essential items to lg or belkin or companies like that doesn't usually result in the quality that apple wants you, you get a monitor that doesn't work when it's near wi-fi remember that yeah that was, yeah the first <laughs> version like yep. it's like mm-hmm. real basic kind of like hey so your job is to take this panel from lg display and make a monitor out of it can you do that 
It's like, it won't be near Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> I mean, we didn't really <laughs> test it near Wi-Fi. We were just surprised as you when we shipped this product out to customers and the thing turns off when it's near Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know what also is pretty mediocre? The Belkin USB-C to Ethernet adapter. Like, mm-hmm. the, it's it, these things, Apple should make these things if they matter. And the monitor matters. <laughs> that, that is definitely an area where it matters. And I hope Apple has learned that. And again, given given how good their recent releases have been, it really does seem like there there was this bad period with the Mac for a few years. They have since turned it around. And it has just taken a while for like the good stuff to really come out. As part of that turnaround, I would expect current day Apple to be making these monitors themselves, not to have LG Electronics, you know, give them another crappy ultra fine solution. Like I, I, I would expect whatever comes out is going to be Apple branded with an Apple price tag sold in Apple stores and hopefully with Apple quality. I sure hope so. And I mean, obviously I'm, I'm burned by this ultra fine experience. <laughs> so burned that I bought a different $300 LG monitor, but nevertheless, um, you don't seem I, that burned. I, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but no, I hate I, this I, LG so much. I'm going to buy two more of them. All right. Well, well, that's the thing. Like when you look like, again, looking for gaming monitors and stuff, most of, a lot of the top choices are often by LG. Cause of course LG makes the panels and LG electronics often packages those panels in a reasonable thing. Like, you know, Asus and, and on razor and whatever, all these other gaming companies also package them, but they're all, they have like RGB lights and these weird pointy things all over them. <laughs> and so if you just want, you just give me the LG display inside like a black rectangular thing. LG Electronics and their monitors, they, they have lots of different options for them. And it's, you know, they're they're one of the better sources to get those things because it's not like you're going to buy an Apple to monitor for your PlayStation or whatever. Yeah, but I mean, I, I am really hopeful that this rumor comes true in some way, shape or form. And I really hope it's sooner rather than later. Like in a perfect world, I will have my 5K back soon and it will actually work and it will stay working for a little while. In a worst case scenario, I will have one or you know at least one of these 4K monitors that I can fall back on if necessary. Um, but I would love I would love to be able to retire this LG Ultrafine 5K and buy an Apple branded, or even if it was an LG electronics display that actually worked better. And if they've learned their lesson from the 5k, I would be okay with that. I just, I would really love to start fresh and try again. And, and I really think that, you know, a 1300, I think the 5k is $1,300 new right now or something like that. That is an expensive monitor. It is very expensive, arguably not worth the thousand dollar premium over the monitors that are sitting in front of me right now, or, you know, one of the monitors sitting in front of me right now, but I would do it because I really love having that, that 5k in front of me. Um, but yeah, but yeah, and so I think an Apple branded version of that, like I would probably pay two grand for an Apple, you know, equivalent of an LG Ultrafine 5k that actually worked reliably. I would probably pay a couple thousand dollars for that. It's just, there's such a gap between, there's a pretty big gap between the you know, $300 monitor that I've come to like and the L- Ultrafine 5k. And there's just this phenomenal gap between the Ultrafine 5K and the XDR. And I really feel like there's a there's a place for at least one, if not a couple of options in that space. Now, uh, kind of tangentially related, I don't trust myself to do this mental math at this time, at this hour, much less, <laughs> probably at any point. But nevertheless, <laughs> if there was an, if there was a 5K 120 hertz HDR monitor we don't have a port that can support that without some sort of compression, right? I feel like you, the three of us have talked about this in the past. Yeah, I think we went through this before. I think it's it's plausible with uh, display stream compression, which gets used for the for the XDR as well in many scenarios. So, so we think we so we think we could do it on today's we, hardware. We need Jonathan Dietz to go through the math again, but yeah, I think it's plausible. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I, I would, and that's the thing is, I think Marco has been saying this as well, and I agree with Marco. Like, if if I couldn't run at 120 hertz on an external display on on the computer that's sitting on my desk right now i'd be okay with that if i didn't have hdr that would that would bum me out too but i'd be okay with that like i just want a reliable 5k display that works that's all i want is a reliable 5k display that works yeah and until we can until we have those in the market like 4k or you know hdr hdr and 120 hertz are just like nice to have in the future bonuses but like until the until those basics are covered 
like we'll be fine like just give us the basics like that's what we need we, the rest of the stuff you can deliver that when you can i feel like it's starting to be table stakes i mean we just assume the big imax is going to have all that stuff we know the laptops have it so it's kind of i know you don't need it to code like i know you don't need hdr or 120 hertz to code and it'll be fine but eventually it just becomes kind of the baseline and you feel disappointed if you don't get it kind of like 24 bit color uh, for I think you PC losers spent decades being like 24 bit colors. Who needs all those colors? That's ridiculous. But I have eventually those. it just becomes the baseline, and now we'd never go to the you know system preferences to a colorist and pick uh, you know <laughs> what is it four eight sixteen uh, two fifty six thousands and millions those or something like that used to be the choices in Mac OS that doesn't exist anymore. 24 bit is just the baseline. I don't need all those colors. It's ridiculous. Uh, eventually, I feel like hdr and in fact improving hdr in terms of like you know what is the what is the maximum brightness can you do it full screen versus a 10 percent window or whatever I mean, not this year maybe but like in a few years just like retina eventually became the floor and we made fun of the remaining non-retina monitors <laughs> hdr and high refresh will be the floor eventually too uh, agreed i just don't know how long that infinite or really ultimately finite time scale is I, uh, but but you know this this is the year when i feel like every single mac that apple sells that has a monitor or can attach to a monitor is probably going to be hdr and and high refresh I, I think you're probably right like that's that is probably what's going to happen but i also agree with casey that like we don't need that at like i'm perfectly like the, the other day i noticed 120 hertz on my laptop i think for the first time <laughs> like what i was scrolling doing? i was scrolling something i think a tweet bot list and that happened to be whatever combination of of you know conditions makes it run at 120 hertz and i was like oh that's pretty smooth but then i instantly forgot about it once i did anything else and it's fine like until I have 120 hertz everywhere. I'm not really going to notice its absence, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I, I do think this is, you know, to tr try to put a positive spin on this, I do think this is great news that there's at least some amount of smoke that there is a fire being built within Apple to to, to make some sort of new monitor. I, I really, really hope that this comes true. And, and I know the Apple way... Uh, maybe not in the last six months to a year, but for a long time, the Apple way was, you know, here's our $6,000 6, 6K monitor. And if you don't want that, then kindly piss off and get one of these, you know, pedestrian $300 ones that only losers use. And I really think that there is room for, I, I, I think there's room for a 24 inch and a 27 inch and a 32 inch. I would love to see all three of those. And see, we'll see what happens. My but. concern is that, if they're making a 24, that probably means the 27 is going to be really expensive, and that's why they have to make a 24. Maybe, maybe. And and obviously, you know, again, I have my hopes for a 5K, but if I had a 4K that was 100% rock solid, which is so far what I'm looking at right now, that wouldn't be so bad. So we'll we'll see. I don't know. I'm, I'm really, really hopeful that this will be a springtime surprise sometime next year, although I don't actually expect it to be by any stretch of the imagination. We are sponsored this week by Squarespace. Start building your website today at squarespace.com slash ATP. Enter offer code ATP at checkout to get 10% off. Make your next move with Squarespace. Squarespace makes it very easy to make websites. And there are so many things these days that need websites. Obviously, this is not news to you. You know this. You're listening to a nerd show. You know about websites. You also probably know how to make websites. But there's also a lot of times where making it yourself from scratch or setting up your own server is not really warranted for the kind of site or the project that you're working on. Or it's really hard to set up the kind of site you're working on. Like if you want to set up your own storefront or like your own podcast hosting and things like that, that can be pretty hard to do yourself. Squarespace makes all of that super easy. So whether you're doing a simple site with a few pages of info to something at like a full-blown store, Squarespace does all of that with ease regardless of your skill level. There is no coding required. You never have to see any kind of source code or anything. You don't have to deal with server maintenance or installing packages or security updates. They handle all of that stuff behind the scenes for you so you just focus on the site it's fantastic so you even as a nerd who can do this yourself you save tons of time and don't add stuff to your plate and if you're not a nerd you can make a website that looks like you had professional nerds like us make it because it, it, it really is an amazing looking site you get from squarespace fully customized however you want it to look no matter what your skill level is See for yourself by starting a free trial site at squarespace.com slash ATP. When you decide to sign up after that, after, after that free trial, go back there, squarespace.com.
squarespace.com slash ATP. Use offer code ATP to get 10% off your first purchase. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash ATP for that free trial and code ATP at checkout when you purchase to get 10% off your first purchase. Thank you so much to Squarespace for making it super easy to make websites. Make your next move with Squarespace. All right, you want to do some Ask ATP? We, we, we need to clear some of this out. So uh, this was added to Ask ATP possibly six months ago, uh, which is relevant when you hear me read that Steve Wellington writes, I'm getting my first iPhone this Friday. <laughs> six months ago. After a decade on Android. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are your favorite things that I should know? Tips, apps, obscure settings, etc. You know, I should have done homework on this. Uh, it's been so long since I've had a new iPhone. Like, I don't even know what's what people don't know these days. I, 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 I don't. I don't think I put this in. So I don't know. Whoever put this in, you got to have some idea of some good tips, and maybe that'll spur my memory and make me think of others. What do you guys got? I suggest Overcast for your podcast needs. Yeah, actually, yes. Yeah, so use Overcast. That's a good idea. You sure you didn't put this in, Casey? Yeah, I think you did. Did I? Well, it was so darn long ago. I've forgotten whatever <laughs> I was going to say then. All right. Well, so here's here's my main tip. Like the part of the reason all of us don't have like, well, what are the tips? I don't remember what it's like to have a new phone is because Apple's uh, system for sort of setting up your new phone like your old one is pretty good, right? Um, and so there are things that we set about the iPhone you know, some of us in 2007, that we have just never thought about or looked at again. Uh, but if we suddenly got a factory fresh phone and all those settings were off, we'd be like, what's weird about this phone? This doesn't work the way I want it to, right? So my first suggestion is to, when you get the iPhone, spend a long amount of time in the settings app just going through every single screen. We can't tell you which exact settings you're going to want to change or whatever. And also it's organized in a really Byzantine way. So we can't even tell you, look in this section, look in that section. Although I will, I will say, uh, do not skip the accessibility section because there's lots of good stuff in there. And just wander through the settings. This is a thing that might sound dumb or boring, but you know, I think for most you know computer enthusiasts, let's say, going through the settings or the preference screen is like the first thing we do in any application, right? What can this thing do? What can I change about it, right? What are the options that I have available? How can I customize it to be the way that I like it? And just go through literally every single setting screen, just for the phone, not for every single app, because apps also put their settings in settings, which is dumb and weird, but whatever. <laughs> and you will find things in there that pique your interest. And maybe you'll change your mind about them, you know, whatever. But like key clicks on or key clicks off, right? Uh, how big do you want the text? Oh, I can change it to make it easier to read. Sometimes you can change the screen resolution. I don't even know if that's still in there. Like make everything bigger or smaller on the phone. I believe display zoom is still offered. Yeah, like there's so many things in there, you know, uh, reduce motion, higher contrast, again, not just accessibility things, sound, what sounds do various things make? Oh, I did you know you can make different sounds for uh, different notifications for, you know, different people who text you and messages or whatever. And when I say the Apple stuff, I mean like the built-in Apple apps as well. Like don't, I'm just saying just don't go through every third party apps uh, setting screen. Settings will bubble up to the top, like the important first party apps, like Safari messages, camera, stuff like that. Um, and just spend some time there getting set up. And Trust that the time you spend setting that crap up will be well spent because the next phone that you get, you won't have to do this all again. It will just carry this stuff over for you, which is why we don't know what any of these settings are. Um, and the final <laughs> thing I'll suggest, just because this is the way I run my phone and a surprising number of people do, is uh, on the side of your iPhone, there is shockingly, surprisingly, a tiny little physical switch called, the, I guess it's the silent button, the ring silence button. What the hell is that button called? Uh, I think it's switch, just called the mute switch. The mute switch. Anyway, it's a physical switch. Uh, and when you put that switch so that the red part is showing, your phone is in like silent mode. Back from the old days when we had feature phones, it was like basically it turned the ringer off, right? Um, if you do that, it's not that nothing on the phone will ever make a sound. It's that the phone won't make a, a sound from its speaker when you're not using it for the most part. And so I think a lot of people, if you don't know what that is or don't don't think about it, you're like, well, I I want audio to come out of my phone. Why would I make it silent? Like... I need to hear things. I want to watch a YouTube video and hear stuff, right? Why would I put the silent switch on? Turning that silent switch on does not stop you from watching a movie on your phone and hearing the audio of that movie out of the phone speakers, right? That will still work. What it does mean is when your phone is off and someone texts you, it will not make a bading sound. It will vibrate instead, right? It will like, you know, to use the, the vibration motor or whatever, the haptic thing in it. And 
I have to say, a few times that I've turned that off and my phone has started bleeping and blooping at me, I was like, what the, oh, I somehow, you know, I must have been cleaning it and I switched the silent switch back to on. I am a strong proponent of just leaving that silent switch on silent for the life of your phone. Mm-hmm. And I and, and a surprising number of people who are longtime iPhone users do that. And it does not really impair your ability to use it or be notified because, again, like, a vibrating iPhone on a hard surface, you'll hear that from across the room. Don't think you won't notice that you got texted. If it's on a pillow, no, you won't hear it, and the ding would be better, right? But it's a physical switch. It's really, really easy to change your mind about that. Oh, I'm about to put my phone down on this pillow and go to the other room, but if I get texted, I want to hear it. Click, put the switch on, go in the other room. Like You don't have to go launch into a screen. You don't even have to unlock your phone. It's a physical button. It's amazing, amazing feature they have. It's a button on the outside of your phone that you don't need to use the screen to access. Take advantage of that button. Decide which how you want it to be set, and don't be afraid to move that switch up and down. That is a very good fidget device, which you shouldn't use it for. But I, yeah, I don't, find yeah, don't terrible don't stress idea. Test, don't stress test the switch. It's probably only good for like you know thirty thousand switches. <laughs> Nonetheless, I th- and as it turns out, I think you were right. This was apparently sent in uh, in September, and I said I was going to add it to the list. And I actually apologized in advance that we probably wouldn't get to it for quote a month quote. So I was a little <laughs> off there, but nevertheless, at least I knew us well enough to know. That's awesome. Yeah, and someone puts on the chat room like when you have that silent thing on, and you're and you're sleeping, and you set the alarm and the clock app, which is a built-in app or whatever the alarm will still go off too like it will wake you up like don't worry that the silent thing is going to stop you from he- like i guess this, i guess this thing you just learn from experience what does the sound thing stop versus what does it not stop for them but for the most part it does smart stuff like if you forget you have that sound switch on but you set an alarm to wake you up at 5 a.m and you put your phone to sleep and plug it in and put it on your nightstand i'm pretty sure that alarm will still go off and make sound yeah alarms alarms will always bypass the mute switch um, and, and there are even certain apps can register for a special entitlement that will allow them to do the same thing. So there are certain like, you know, like custom apps from other people who are not Apple that are like important alerts of some type, um, that, that can do that as well. Um, yeah. And the only thing I, w- I would add a couple of small things to, to this question. Um, number one, I, I would suggest, um, turning off turning down the sensitivity of face IDs security um, in one key way there's a switch under face ID and passcode require attention for face ID this means basically like require you to be looking at it to actually you know count as face ID I would say this is not necessary for many people. Evaluate your own security needs, and if this is not necessary for you, that's fine to turn off. I would also turn off the switch right below it. Attention-aware features, which should have a hyphen between attention and aware, but doesn't, because I guess they're expensive in California. And (laughs) it shows that you have a notification on the lock screen, but until you look at it and unlock it with your face, it doesn't show you the contents of the notification. This, again, is a level of security that I personally don't need. Many people don't need. I, I love that feature. I right. So that. evaluate your own security needs. If you don't need that feature, don't use it. Um, and beyond that, I would, I would kind of go a, a little bit extending what John was saying. I would say use the built-in apps first before you seek out a replacement in most cases. Because when you use Apple's built-in apps for things like notes and reminders and stuff like that, mail, the you know, Safari, when you use the built-in apps, a lot of things about the system work better or are more convenient or are less of a pain in your butt or enable certain kind of integrated features that you might enjoy. And that's part of the big benefit of Apple stuff is when you when you buy in further into Apple stuff, when you use more of their integration, more of their first party apps, you get a lot more of those cool features. And over time, as they add more of those features, you know, every WBDC, they announce some new thing. It's like, well, this is going to be great, but I don't use reminders or whatever. And then you're disappointed. It's good to minimize those, those areas that are unnecessarily using third party apps where the first party app actually would cover your needs just fine. So by default, I would say try Apple's built in stuff in most cases, except for the podcast app, which is garbage. Use overcast. (laughs) Sam writes, do any of you use a finder alternative pathfinder for one example, proudly declares the one John Syracuse, the name sounds familiar, reviewed it and called it a quote tour de force. Things change over the years, so I wonder whether and you have any opinions on these apps these days. Do you use a finder app replacement? I think that Pathfinder review was uh, got to be over a decade ago, right? I don't even want to look up how many years ago it was. Um, but Pathfinder still exists. In fact, I just recently bought the latest version of it as part of some big app bundle thing that I found myself buying. Um, so the problem with Finder alternatives is kind of like what Marco was just talking about. Uh, Apple 
does not make it particularly easy to supplant a lot of its built-in apps. So the part of the reason why using Safari is so convenient is, uh, well, I don't know, is this still true? Are they just they let you replace your your mail app and your web browser on Correct. iOS now? Yeah, basically right. to handle like mail to and and URL. All right. Links. So so I need another example, but like uh, Apple is, has been slow on iOS in letting you replace all the built-in apps with custom versions of like Reminder. I think still can't be replaced as the default, right? Um, that is correct. Yeah, reminders, um, certainly you know, things like notes and um, or, or things like Siri. You can't replace Siri yeah. with uh, music, the Amazon maps, right? Yeah. Um, so that's that's an annoyance. Um, and on the Mac, the Finder is not easy to replace. Yes, there are ways you can, you can obviously you can quit the Finder. That's a thing you can do pretty easily, and you can run another app instead of the Finder. But lots of other apps, especially in the olden days, maybe less now, but like would send Apple events to the Finder to have it do something. They just expect the Finder to be there, and they expect the Finder to be the thing that they talk to to do file management. So if you try to use a third-party one, you are, you know, swimming against the tide. Lots of things in the system will try to relaunch the Finder or try to do things with the Finder, and Pathfinder is not the Finder. Um, I don't use a Finder alternative partly for that reason and also partly because Pathfinder, which is, I think, the best Finder alternative, is an extremely powerful browser style <laughs> file manager. I don't want a browser style file manager. If I wanted one, Pathfinder's there and you can use it. You can use it in addition to the Finder, which, you know, if you want a better, cooler browser that does more stuff, just run Pathfinder all day, but then also run the Finder and just don't open any windows in it. I want a spatial finder. Nobody really makes one of those. And even if they did, like part of the benefit of the finder that I want to see is it has to be the actual finder, the default one, the one that everybody uses and not some third party thing that I'm constantly trying to run, but being chucked back into the other one. So the answer is no, I don't use it, but Pathfinder is super cool. You should check it out. It may appeal to you, but keep in mind that you will be fighting against the entire operating system and the entire Apple corporation that wants you to just use the finder. (laughs) All right. Yonda G writes, uh, Swift can be used in the command line, and I expect that you can also use it for automation, like what people do with Python. I also read that you apparently can also run Swift with Linux and Windows. Do you guys have experience in using Swift for other purposes in creating iOS and macOS apps? Uh, I do a little bit. Uh, my bespoke, uh, I'll call it a script, although it's probably more of a command line app, uh, that I use to file away my pictures, that is a Swift command line app. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. Swift, you know, Latner, I think on this very program, Latner has said, and he's certainly said in other places, that he envisions Swift to, you know, uh, its goal is world domination. So you can use it, you know, for super, um, uh, super important, low-level stuff, and you can use it for scripts. And yes, one could use Swift for that sort of a thing, but I wouldn't say it's terribly well-positioned for that sort of a thing, since it it really is designed to be compiled, and, and it's not, it, it, it just doesn't feel to me like it's that's the right fit. That's just my experience. Again, and like a command line app is a little bit different, but for like something more along, along the lines of what I would turn to like Python, or, or I guess if I was an old man, Perl, or if I really liked weird technology, PHP, um, you know, mm-hmm. I, 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 I could use one of those things. And honestly, if it were me, if I wasn't going to use like Bash or just a fish script or something like that, then I would probably turn to Python myself. Marco, what's your thoughts on this? I pretty much agree. A Swift, while I'm developing an appreciation for it as I use it more and more in, in my app development, um, what you want out of that kind of language, out of like, you know, a command line utilities kind of language is a little more quick and dirty of a style of a language. And and Swift is so rigid and unforgiving. The the type strictness, I can understand the value of it when building like, you know, a, a larger app, you know, for public distribution for something like, you know, a shell script or or something that is that is a quick little command line utility. Swift is just too cumbersome and and too picky. Um, the other thing I would say about Swift is that its string handling sucks. I kind of can't believe that a language developed so recently has such bad string handling. All right, now hold on, hold on. Well, it, let me let me quickly jump in. First of all, string handling sucks in Swift. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. But I think the reason is because it's too academic and it tries to be too uh, pedantically correct in too many cases. And that's at the cost of an easy-to-use API surface or it, it, it just an easy-to-use API. So I understand why it sucks. And I agree with you it sucks. I agree with you it shouldn't suck. But there is at least a reason behind it. But it still totally sucks. 
Yeah. And like there's I mean so much of modern programming is string processing on, on in many ways. Like it's string processing is just everywhere. That's why it's so generally like good and friendly in most web development languages because the web uses tons of string processing and modern programming in general uses tons of string processing and when you're dealing with command line stuff you're probably dealing with a lot of string processing and that's why Perl is so often used in this way because Perl was you know it, as for all of its weird little faults it's pretty good at string processing um, Python I, from what I understand I don't have a lot of I don't have any experience with Python really um, but I understand it's pretty good at it too and Swift is just terrible at string pro- it's just so um, cumbersome to use with strings uh, and it seems like the api was designed as casey said uh, you know for academic perfection rather than the actual practical needs of most programmers doing string processing so it, for those reasons it's it's just I, I could use swift for this kind of thing but other tools are usually better and i will reach for them almost every time in this kind of context so i'm going to agree with your conclusion but not for the exact reasons that you stated so the main problem that Swift has as a kind of like, have you used it for something that's not an iOS or a Mac OS app? Like the, the type strictness is, is an issue, right? And like it, that's just the type of language it is. But most of the things you do from like, you know, like a, just a, a command line program or something that's not a GUI app or whatever, or just basic scripting, you only ever really need to deal with like one or two types. You need to deal with string, which we've talked about and I'll get back to in a second, and then some kind of numbers, right? Or if you wanted, you can just treat the numbers as strings and have some convertible thing that works in some scripting mode or whatever. You, that's basically it. Like, especially in one-off little scripty things, you're not defining a bunch of new types and whatever. And like, if you just deal with the built-in types and easy conversion between them, even if you get into things like URLs and dates, um, you, you're probably okay with the type like the type system is not going to kill you right what's going to kill you is the api and I'm not about well, actually before i get to that it's not the compiled nature either perl is a compiled language as well having a compilation phase is fine as long as it, that compilation phase is fast enough perl's compilation phase is so fast people don't even know it exists but perl is a compiled language it goes through your whole program loads all of it and all the files that it includes and all the other things and has a compile phase in which it compiles it before it runs it it's a little more complicated than that, but it is not an interpreted language where it goes a line by line and doesn't, you know, doesn't even know what the next line is going to be before it executes it. It compiles it. So being a compiled language is no barrier to this. And I'm, I'm assuming Python and PHP are similar in that way that they have a compile phase. Swift has a compile phase. You can use a, you can write a, a, a command line script, Swift thing. And when it runs with the little, you know, hash exclamation point, whatever user bin Swift, it compiles it on the fly for you and runs it. You don't have to compile it and make, you know, like a C program and make your your a dot out executable and run that it does it does it for you right so that's not the barrier the real barrier is its api is not good for those common things that i just said strings dates urls uh and it's not because they're like oh they're academically correct and it's a hard problem i will point to pearl pearl has academically correct string string i know right right yeah pearl has academically correct string handling with all the unicode crap in it and it is complicated and if you care about the nuances of Unicode normalization and all that stuff, you can do that all in Perl and fast, by the way. But if you don't care about it, Perl's API and interface to dealing with strings does not make you care about it. And Swift's API makes you not only have to care about it, like it just shoves it in your face. We just talked in the chat room. The thing we were talking about in the Slack is I want to extract a substring from a string. Swift's API is to find a substring type that is not a string. And because Swift is type safe, <laughs> you can't take a substring and pass it to a function that wants a string because it's a substring. You have to r- construct a new string by using the string constructor on the substring you just got from a string. And nobody <laughs> expects that. <laughs> nobody expects that to happen. And it's not the biggest deal in the world. It's like, oh, once you just know that, you just do it. It's like, yeah, but it's inconvenient. That, that throws the type system in my face in a way that I don't want to. Or just... You know, I mean, regular expressions are coming to Swift, see the Swift forums and the discussion of it. I, I uh, participated in a little bit trying to say that, like, you know, the Perl motto from ages ago, easy things should be easy, hard things should be possible. Easy things are not easy in Swift, and it's not because it's a pilot, compiled language, it's not because it's a type-safe language, it's because the APIs to do easy things is not easy. Like, it's not convenient, right? It's not... It's not like I'll just do the first thing I think and it'll probably work. If you if you like, have never programmed in like if you program just in one of these languages and you hop into PHP and you hop into JavaScript or you hop into Perl, you're gonna guess right like more than fifty percent of the time about how to do stuff related to strings 
Or if you don't, you just look it up and it's like, oh, they spell it a little bit differently. None of that knowledge transfers to Swift. You're like, how the hell do I find, you know, do I replace a substring in a string? How do I construct a URL and get its components? It was just today a big proposal and say, oh, by the way, if you pass a string to the URL constructor, uh, constructor, if you just did a URL double quote and then like a string, because of the, you know, a string convertible thing that they built in or whatever, even if it's like HTTP colon slash slash triple W dot Apple dot com, it will be con- it'll construct a file URL for you out of that because the string got literal converted to a file URL and then that file URL got passed to the constructor. Right. And so they want to make a change. Says, <laughs> hey, if I pass HTTP, like, shouldn't it just look at the HTTP and realize this is not a file URL? And that's the change they're proposing. That means for years now, this behavior has gone on. If you were doing a script, you never want that to happen. You, you don't want to be surprised by stuff like that. Swift just does not have an API that lends itself to let me just write 15 lines of code and not be surprised. Right. Um, and Arguably, all those same things make it more annoying to use in quote unquote real apps too, but it's more tolerable in real apps because it's like, well, this is a more serious endeavor. I should think more about my types or whatever. When you're doing a one-off script, it's not that you don't want to deal with the types at all or anything like that. You just want to, you just want the obvious thing to work and you want easy things to be easy. And that's where Swift is falling down as a scripting language. And then the final thing I'll add is all three of us, I think, prob- well, maybe not Casey, no, probably still Casey. Uh, I think we all know some other language better than we know Swift that is better at this job. Marco knows PHP better than he knows Swift. I know Perl better than I know Swift. Maybe Casey knows Python or something better than he knows Swift for these purposes. <laughs> Casey's using C Sharp for all of his shell yeah, scripts. Or C Sharp. Like, <laughs> the, the, the thing is... PowerShell, it, baby. When you want to bang something out and you're uh, an experienced programmer who has a deep experience with even just one language that is vaguely suited to the task, it is so much more efficient to just say, even though there's a better tool for this job, I know this tool like the back of my hand. So I'm going to ignore the supposedly better tools and just bang out what I know will work. It's why my stupid CMS site generator is written in Perl and why Marcos is written in PHP. Because those are the languages we know best and we could bang it out now. We don't have to think about it. And it works fine for that purpose. Yeah, and that's why for a lot of things, I'll turn to Python, which I know okay. Like I, if it were an actual spoken language, I, it would it would probably be a bit of a stretch to say I, I am conversational in Python, but I feel like that's kind of where I'm at. Um, but it, And I would turn to Python for these sorts of things, even though I don't know it super well, but because it feels like a much better tool for the job than Swift would be. Thanks to our sponsors this week, Squarespace, Mac Weldon, and Linode. And thanks to our members who support us directly, you can join at atp.fm slash join. We will talk to you all next week. Now the show is over. They didn't even mean to begin. Because it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. John didn't do any research. Marco and Casey wouldn't let Cause it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. And you can find the show notes at atp.fm. And if you're into Twitter, you can follow them at C A S E Y L I S S. So that's Casey Liss, M A R C O A R M E N T Marco Armin S I R A C. USA Syracuse, it's accidental. So I've been alluding to, or kind of casually hinting at, uh, I had a Synology adventure a little while ago, which I'd like to uh, <laughs> vibra slap, which I'd like it's to. It's only briefly the first mentioned, Marco. Come on. I, well, it was a little one. hour over here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So in any case, uh, so again, I have an eight an eight bay Synology. The first two drives are Time Machine RAID zero. The remaining six drives are Synology Hybrid RAID, which is uh, their version of some other flavor of RAID. I forget which one. It's like what Drobos do. Like that's it, it's their version of it's like it's a dynamically expandable, like kind of software based RAID that abstracts away a lot of the details. It's not like a straight RAID one um, or straight RAID five or anything like that. But it's it's just like their dynamic thing that has some redundancy, how depending on how you set it. And is kind of managed in software, so it can be expanded over time without breaking the whole array. 
So, and speaking of that, Marco, quick aside, uh, what file system did you pick for your Synology? Um, I did what it did by default through the iOS app, which I was curious what the heck it did because I was intending RAID 1 because um, I, I got two identical disks. No, no and... not RAID, the file system. Oh, I have no idea. Whatever's the... BTR now or Butter or whatever it's called, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest, that if you didn't pick that, now is a good time to maybe change that decision because BTRFS has, is, the I think, the best choice. All right, I'll check it. I mean, I, I, it's whatever whatever was default. And I, I thought it was interesting that by default, it just did SHR as the RAID setup. So even though I only had two disks, it didn't even ask me. It just set up set them up as a, as a SHR, which in theory, I, I was a, I was a little bit upset by that because I'm like, I, I, RAID one would be faster probably. Uh, mm. But I also think like in the grand scheme of things, like I'm probably only ever going to have two drives in here, and I might want expansion. And, and you don't want to have to match the size exactly. So like I, I might want the expansion down the road. So I figure that's fine for my purposes here. So in my RAID 0 array of two drives that is used only for a time machine. It's pronounced RAIDO. RAIDO. My, my RAIDO array <laughs> uh, the, it, with the two drives. Uh, one of them was dying. And that wasn't great, but wasn't the biggest deal because it's my time machine uh, uh, you know, uh, volume. I don't use it for anything else. It's, it's not the end of the earth. So I tried to play this smart instead of fast and loose. And I decided to wait until my periodic time comes when I back up the entire Synology to a single physical external drive, which then gets plugged into uh, my Mac mini server so it can go up to Backblaze. So I waited the week and a half because I do this every couple of weeks and I waited the week and a half or whatever it was until the Backblaze backup was completed. And then I went to, I set about to replace drive two. This is a three terabyte drive. I think it had been in the machine since you know, when, when I got it in 2013, it, it's not unreasonable that it was time to replace it. And since I don't need a ton of time machine space and I don't really care that much about time machine, to be honest, I, I don't know that I've used it in literally years, but I like having it as yet another backup. So I bought a, a basically the ex- exact same drive to put back in. And so I got another three terabyte drive to put in. They still sell those. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't even remember how much it was to be honest with you, but yes, they do. Um, so I decide to, I, I think to myself, well, I'm pretty sure this mach- this DS1813 Plus can hot swap. Why don't I just do that? I always used to shut it down when I was you know doing a, a what, drive swap. What do you think? You, hot swapping to you just means I didn't have to turn the power off to the thing to take out the drive, but it's RAID 0. Like, the thing, <laughs> yeah, you there's... can't take out one of the drives. Right, right, right. No, no, totally. I knew I was going to have to... I knew I was going to lose everything. I knew I was going to have to re- recreate the volume and so on and so forth. But could I just hot swap the physical drive and have the Synology understandably freak out and then tell it, you know, just... Put everything back, please. I, to be kinder to the thing, what I would have done is destroyed the volume, destroyed the RAID 0 volume, and just said, now you just have two empty disks. And then if you want to do a hot swap experiment, leave the thing on and yank out the drive. That See, this is why you're smarter than me, because that didn't even cross my mind. It didn't even cross my mind. Well, one, one question I have is, like, how do you know which volume Synology's OS is installed on? You know, I, I yeah, agree. There's, there's, agree. You can look this up, but yeah. I, my main question is, how do you make sure that the one you're yanking out is the bad one? Because they all look the same from the front. <laughs> well, so <laughs> you they start actually from left to right or right to left. They and they number from left to right. Is it drive zero or drive one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they number from left to right, and there is actually a feature. Yeah, I forget where it is. In I think Storage Manager, there is a feature that where they where you can go and and I think they call it identify, and you can have it identify that drive. It'll play music on the voice coils inside the hard drive. No. <laughs> stop it so uh <laughs> it, it plays uh, the imperial march right you know and, it should play do 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 <laughs> yeah right it'll play the wa- the washing machine thing, or the freezer <laughs> thing um so no what it does is it turns the the light on that particular drive amber instead of green and because at this point it was dying it was not dead so it was still showing what, green what made you think that it was dying by the way because it said it, it, i got emails about it literally every day right, or two what saying it, what did it say i forget i could dig it up but i because I get it, periodic emails about my drive help too, and I think it said it would like, kept reconnecting or something like that. Oh, I forget right. exactly. Yeah, what I haven't else. gotten that message. Um, so anyway, so I decided to hot swap, and you, you, you two are a thousand percent correct. I should have destroyed the volume first, and so on and so forth. But I didn't. I just hot swapped it, and everything took a dump. Everything took a real big dump. So it, I tried to do that, and 
Suddenly, the web interface kind of stops responding, which was not entirely <laughs> oh, no. surprising, but I'm um, thinking this is not good. Was it the OS drive? <laughs> uh, maybe. I don't even know, to be honest with you. I, still to this day, I don't know. <laughs> this um, would be a thing to check before, again, before yanking drives out of your computer. Perhaps, perhaps. Also, probably not the best to have the OS on a RAID 0 volume. <laughs> well, but, uh, well, I don't even know how to move it. Like, even if that's true. Listener, if, if that's it, true. It, it's not It's not about moving it. It's about not creating, like when you do like volume groups, don't create any new volume volumes in the volume group that has the OS on it. No. Oh, I mean it's a bit late for that now, isn't it, gentlemen? Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> um so I, I uh, everything takes a dump. You know, the web the web interface uh isn't really working or it's sort of working. It's like I'm on a like a you know, 1400 baud modem. Occasionally it'll work a little bit, then just kind of crash. Uh, or not, I shouldn't say crash. It just doesn't really do anything. I try entering my username and password and that doesn't really work. Um, and so eventually I was able to request a shutdown. I forget how I did that. I don't remember if it was through the web or by like an iPhone app or something. And it started to shut down, but it didn't succeed after literally like 15 minutes. And so I said, ah, screw it. I'm just going to force the damn thing to shut down, which I know I shouldn't do. But at this point, like I don't have a Synology for all intents and purposes. So I need to do something. So I force a shutdown and I boot it back up and it's very, very upset. And it wants me to enter... Uh, username and password, and I try entering my username and password, and it doesn't accept. Or I tried entering my username and password, and it accepts it, but it refuses to accept my one time password, you know, the little six digit thing. And I try that, and I try that, and I keep trying that, and it's still not working. And now I'm running out of chances before it like locks my entire account out. So then I think to myself, all right, well, surely I will try to use, all right, surely I can use the admin account, you know, the, the out-of-the-box administrative account, which I know I've changed the password for, and there's only three or four options of passwords I would likely use for it. So I'll try that. And that doesn't work. So let's recap. I have a Synology that has eventually booted itself, and it is literally beeping because, you know, the volume has crashed, so it wants my attention. It is booted, but I can't log in using the login I usually use. I don't think I have any other administrative logins except the actual admin administrator account, which it won't accept the password for that either. So I literally cannot log into my Synology. What do you do? Quick, quick real-time follow-up, by the way, about, about the operating system. Uh, someone in the chat room said, and I just did a quick Google that found at least some supporting evidence, that Synology stores the OS and all of the data related to the OS on all of the hard drives. Oh, that's cool. So as long as, as, long as you have one disk that still works, you should, in theory, have your OS and all your settings. That does not necessarily mean that Casey hasn't hosed himself. So continue your story. All right. So, so pop quiz hotshot. You can't log in with your username, password, and one-time password. You can't log in to an, with an administrator account. What do you do? You have physical access to the machine. You can boot in with like the firmware mode and go into a actually single user mode. You know what I mean? Yeah. Isn't there like a reset hole in the back? There is a reset hole. No, just single, single user mode. Like it, back in the old days, in regular Unix, you could boot into single user mode, where it's not in multi user, and the one because you have physical access, and there's some you know thing that you have to press to make that happen. But then you are essentially root on the thing, and you can fix whatever's broken. So what you can do, and double check me on this if you're listening, for the love of all that is good and holy, double check me on this because I googled to figure out the right answer, but. There is a reset hole with a button within it uh, in the back of the machine. And if you, I, I forget the details, but it's like if you press it for a small amount of time, it will basically reset like the administrative password or something like that, if I remember right. But if you hold it for a really long time, it will straight up reset everything. And if you hold it long enough, it will straight up reset everything to the point that you lose your data. So there's like two or three stages of reset. And so I did the littlest bit of reset. <laughs> <laughs> and that got me into the administrator account with the default password. That just like resets the wallpaper. <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, no, I got into the administrator account with, with the default password, and then I was able to restore my account. With, well, I shouldn't even say restore it. I think I know what the problem is. What would cause my, my username and password, which, which is one of the few passwords I have memorized, and my one-time password, which is stored in one password, not work? What would cause that to not work? Date and time room? I think so. Yeah. I think the date and time got out of whack, and that's why the one-time password wouldn't work. Because if my, my limited understanding of how one-time passwords work is they have some sort of seed value. Jump in, gentlemen, when you're ready. They have some sort of seed value, and they know they compare the time to like some reference and can compute via algorithm what these six digits should be at this time. And if the time isn't agreed upon between your device and the device you're trying to log into, 
that will cause it. So whoopsie dupsy. So I did a, you know, update to the time I was able to get back into my account. And then when I was putting everything back and, you know, trying to restore everything, it was very, very angry at me that the administrative account was enabled at all because to their eyes, that's very ripe for a, you know, like dictionary attack or something like that. And, and so they really, really, really don't want you to have the administrative account active. But the problem is when you're a single person company and a single person Synology user, I only had the administrative account, which I surely had disabled, you know, because I did what they told me to do and my own account. It's not like I could go to Bob down the hall and say, hey, Bob, can you log in with your administrative account and get us all squared away again? So I, I think that that really kind of hosed me. But the good news is I was able to not only, you know, get my normal account back with, with very minimal uh, loss of uh, data or settings or anything like that, but I was eventually able to set up a administrative account that is not my normal account that does not use the username admin. And I was able to set all that up and I have a ridiculously strong password for that that's stored in one password, but I decided not to turn on the one-time password for that. So this way uh, I will never have that particular problem again. But for a brief window of time, again, I thought that I had lost everything on my Synology, which was not delightful. And thankfully, I had been smart enough to wait until everything was confirmed to be in Backblaze before I did all this dance. But wow, that was a very tense like two hours while I was trying to figure all this out. And it was not fun. You have some, uh, like your impulse control when it comes to technology. Like when we're talking to you now, you're like, oh, yeah, no, I probably should have destroyed the volume first. Or whatever. But in the moment, you're so excited about hot swapping. You're just like, let's see what happens when I yank yeah, this out. Yeah, why not, you're not, man? You're not projecting forward in time and saying, well, what's the worst that could happen if I yank this out? And you almost saw what the worst thing can happen yeah. if you yanked it out. So yeah, so now Drive Two is back up and running, and or in volume the vo the time machine volume is back up and running. I did lose, of course, everything on that volume, but that's fine. Uh, but yeah, what a what a nightmare! It was a self created nightmare, but what a nightmare that was. And I was so thankful that that Synologies have this like multi tier reset paradigm, wherein I could get myself logged in because I have physical access to the machine. I could get myself logged in without having to reset all my settings and all that jazz. Yeah, so. that's usually physical access usually means that you, if there's if there's working stuff inside there, you can get to it. That's the whole point of physical access. So this is something you have to hold down or press or do, but you can get back in. And I, I, if this, you know, I'll have to look more into this, but like the idea that, that Synology puts the OS in every single drive is uh, is interesting and clever. Another reason to uh, like how they do things. I was just thinking of that with Marco. I was like, oh, I'd only need, you know, I just have two drives or whatever. Well, you you know, especially if you just have a single volume, uh, you're like, oh, if one of them goes bad, who cares? I'm assuming you'll have to reset up your whole OS. Right, because if you destroy that volume and it's the only volume, you've also destroyed all your settings and stuff. If like a disk went bad, like if you raid zero, it is what I'm saying. It's like because you don't have a second place for the OS to be. You have a single raid zero volume. Maybe it's on all, all each individual hard. I don't know. I don't know quite how it works, but I would, I would not try. Like I, I always feel better having, you know, at least three drives. I, I know you bought a four bay thing, but you only put two drives in it. Maybe. Maybe get a small third one and throw it in there just to be like your OS backup boot drive so that the other two can be totally hosed and you won't lose all your settings. Then again, you probably don't have too many settings, but it is annoying to go back through and reset up the time machine volume and set up quotas for people or whatever you did, you know? Actually, I couldn't even do the quotas um, because the quota for TIFF's computer needs to be 8 terabytes, and the most it'll let you enter is 4 terabytes, presumably for some kind of integer limit <laughs> somewhere. But so, like, you, I literally, so I'm just like, well, I guess I guess I just won't use quotas then. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't use quotas. And, it, like, it takes care of itself, and then whoever's filling the thing, you'll see their poor Mac, say, cleaning up, like, or, free, uh, you know, freeing up space. Like, if you look in the Time Machine menu bar, it says, like, freeing up space, and it will do that for a long time. But what it's doing is saying, oh, well, the disk is running out of room and I'm in the middle of doing a backup and I know that I can't do my next backup unless I clean up space and it will delete like a whole bunch of old backups and they'll all just fight with each other over that last scrap of space. It, it also is a good <laughs> idea to uh, to change like Synology will email you if like a volume is getting low in space and you can choose what threshold it will email you. If you have the threshold set like too high, like if you have it set, please email me when you have 20% space left, you will be emailed forever, right? Because Time Machine will never leave 20% free but time machine will leave you know 8% free so if you set the threshold to be like 5% then you'll only get the email when like something has gone wrong you know with time machine and it hasn't been able to free up space or something yeah that's the only reason I ever want this analogy to email me is a hard drive has died like that's I want to know that 
I want no other emails from this device that is... Didn't you like the, uh, the health report ones that tell you how many bad sectors all your hard drives have? I turn those off after a while, or they stop working. One of those. And they, somehow they were <laughs> oh, turned wow. off. Um, because that gives you the, like, the pre-warning of like, if you get an email and said there's one bad sector, right? And then the next week you get an email and says there's 10 bad sectors, maybe start shopping for a new hard drive, right? But, you know, I, I still get the emails, I think, monthly. And like, I've had a hard drive that's had one bad sector for like six years. <laughs> and that's fine. Like hard drives have bad sectors and it just keeps emailing me. And I just look at that number. And if it's still one, I'm like, everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> if it's, if it's 110, I need a new drive. 